Okay, taking the steam of the dog energy, do you think Frank was aware of his dog energy, or that was so much what Gurdjieff would call your chief characteristic, and, and he wasn't aware of it? Mm -hmm. He just he just was lucky to be able to carry it out because he had the talent to create the environment to have perpetual motion, so to speak. Yeah, I think so. You don't think he was aware of his dog energy? I think Frank was not. I mean, he was certainly capable of discernment psychologically, but he wasn't given to self-examination. So. Yeah, now that's interesting. What he what he examined was. And you get into this section of the book where you're measuring the sock. <laughs> he, he's manipulating his voice on you. He's massaging you with his yeah, voice, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, what did you do with the sock? That I've got it, actually, at home. It's in a frame. Do you do? Yeah, it's a you know, little shrine that I have in the living room. Yeah. Is it? Do you communicate to us what you did with the sock, or is it only implied? <laughs> I think I, I'm sorry, what was, the, what was the question? I didn't, I didn't well, understand. when you have that sexual encounter where he's, mm -hmm. he's testing the voice on mm -hmm. you, and you're, right. he's getting you out of control, right? what did you do with the sock? <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the sock bit? Because you refer back to it through the book. <laughs> Can you say that, or you don't sure. want to? Sure, the sock, well, it was symbolic, obviously. I mean, you have sex with somebody, and... You know, he would be laying the sock on different the sock parts? Is, yeah, you know, I he like does that. Yeah. Doesn't he do that in Uncle Me? He's la like Don, yeah, Don Preston, he's laying That's out right, little yeah. things. Little objects, right, because he was talking there about fetishism, you know, people who like to have sex with objects or whatever, and he was really fascinated. See, it's like your question earlier, did he, you know, how much was he aware of his own say dog energy whatever I think Frank to him that object was such a metaphysical thing to him because look what it symbolized it wasn't and it wasn't just a, a symbol it was a physical reality you jump over the bridge like you use an instrument to play music to get you into you know who knows where in the universe that sock was also that was his the microscope piece. there you go that was that was the scientist now this is that's Dr. Zirkin it's the Dr. Zirkin side of his personality now that just a little I go back to this before we get mm -hmm. into the science thing I read. You ever read? Did you read Miles' articles in yes. 1970 when yes. they used to come out? Absolutely. He had the best. Yeah. He, he was the good. one who started yeah. to notice the conceptual continuity yeah. Yeah, too. Yeah, he did. He did. He noticed Frank down there in the basement cranking out tapes, and right. little pieces of things together. And yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I read that really great uh, Miles interview in, when I was in Seattle in the fall '69, mm -hmm. and he asked Frank, "How much does the idea, capital letters?" control yeah. or modulate right. music and Frank didn't really talk about it he just went into the archetypes of art and room yeah. and the jets and stuff yeah. I think actually I would say that gave him the idea of the conceptual continuity that mm -hmm. that the idea and I said he didn't answer that I want to know more about the idea <laughs> and yeah. I never could understand I even worked on it in this interview what did he say when you asked him well I kept working on it he no. wouldn't admit hmm. if you wanted to present to go at him as a great mind he would go physical oh, no, 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 no. He'd yeah swip. He'd exactly swip. you see yeah. he because he really in a certain sense, as brilliant as he was, was kind of anti-intellectual. That's right. He, he, it was a Zen training, I think, because he went through a big Zen phase, and he didn't... I mean, when he started intellectualizing it, you've lost it. That right. was the way he looked at but it. But at the same time, so if, you, if you played... If he, if you just started to regard Frank as one of the guys in the physical, he would get snobby oh, and yeah. aloof. Yeah. So he'd flip yeah. back and yeah. forth. Yeah. Now, I wonder but how he's much... He's perverse, that's all. Yeah. No, that, well, maybe it was... That's what I wanted. I was trying to pursue is yeah. that conscious. Whatever Frank couldn't have was what he most wanted. If it was too easy to have, forget it. He didn't have any interest in it whatsoever. And that that worked, that was so he, a postulate that worked every time with him. Isn't it the sign of a Capricorn? They're stubborn workers. <laughs> <laughs> you, you always wanted to have a task, right? I always thought he was a Sagittarius. So. Oh, you're right. It's, it's December. Yeah. It's, it's right on the cusp. First, yeah. I, I looked him up once in an ephemeris, and it, it was it was Sagittarius for a few more hours, and then it turned to Capricorn. Yeah. And what Capricorn ascendant, though. Yeah, what it, what is the characteristic of Sagittarius? Stubborn, I think. Not stubborn so much as um, um, dogged. <laughs> not really. It's a mutable sign. It's fire sign. It's um, um, kind of looking for. Well, how do you put it? In it's, it's adventure, really. Really, it's, yeah. it's adventurous. It's an adventurous sign, the most. Yeah, practically. Yeah. Whereas Capricorn, do you know more, what Capricorn more con is? More conservative. So he had both men. Well, yeah, he right did. on the cusp. Yeah, he did. Yeah. 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 Okay, so. Um, what was we were just talking well, we yeah. about? The sock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So when I saw him play out these things, mm -hmm. I sort of thought he was satirizing people with those fetishes. Mm -hmm. You reveal he had those fetishes, or he, he consciously had them because he used them. He, he would externalize them on other people. Yeah. But he, he had them. Sure he so had he, them. So he, so he measured you with the sock. Right. Is the point. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, did you feel resistant in just saying that, or you hadn't thought of saying that point no, in the book? I mean, oh. Uh, I thought it was implied. By oh the yeah, I, maybe I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I didn't, didn't want to get too kind of sleazy with some of the descriptions because then they would lose. I think their kind of yeah. their resonance as, as you know guideposts in this relationship, little markers and things. Yeah, it was almost like Frank's 
uh, what might appear to be perverse, was just the, the laboratory technique. Yeah. It wasn't the main point. Main right. point. He was studying. Yeah. And I just reread that this morning. And he actually was doing the alkyl meat on you, <laughs> studying, yeah. you know, right. sound levels yeah, on right. you. Oh, if we do this to you, we right. do that with my voice like this. So he was he was really media massaging you. Oh yeah. With this yeah. thing. He did that. He did that a lot. Yeah. And that really is a model, a, a micro model of his whole approach to music, it right? Was. That was why I included it because I thought it was yeah. just so. It was like so central to everything that he did in his modus operandi work wise so yeah. when he did that then you wouldn't understand that when did you understand that about i got with frixie I, under, I understood i think virtually everything unconsciously right you, because um, you were able to and understand it you know i it's funny because and those were the things that attracted me the most to Frank. Was is just it was so unorthodox. Just blasted the roof, out, you know, off of everything. Well, you actually were hijacked by a maniac, oh, by yeah. an alien. And it was and, terrific. And little girls giggling. Yeah. And yeah. Like, ah. This is great. <laughs> I had nothing to lose. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, at that no, point, you, you really were. You were hijacked by an alien. Yeah. Totally unexpected. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's a mind blower about the book. You get to tell everybody, hey, Frank was an alien. <laughs> <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> measuring me with a sock. <laughs> that's pretty yeah. amazing. It's you know, no, because there's that question there too. It's like doctors are kind. Of, what's the word for love in your universe? Because yeah. I, I actually asked him that question. He okay. Just sort of gave me one of those looks. You know, like like professor Poopmeister. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold that thought because yeah. just yeah. go back. That was the Miles thing mm -hmm. describes that he had the sign on his lab on mm -hmm. his thing. Dr. Zircon in lab Happy, Happy Valley. Valley. Yeah. Now, right. I've mentioned Dr. Zircon to people no one knew it. You're the first person who knew the name mm -hmm. yeah. and knew it at the right time. Yeah. And you don't say where, I just noticed, I don't yeah. think you say where Dr. Zircon comes yeah. from. Yeah, I know, because it's, it, it's so, so much a part of my like unconscious when I was writing it. Yeah, you mean you would admit, you would say you should have said it. I should have put it yeah. somewhere, yeah. But yeah, that would... But in a way it's better because <laughs> this way he's the yeah. character. And of course, you know, we can get into where Zircon really came from. Oh, where? What's that? Um, well, it's a little bit like Jack Kerouac and Dr. Sachs, same yeah. kind of a character, this dark, shadowy character, things that kind of terrify you in a way, in ways of objectifying them and making them uh, That's how he explained them you. to you? No, 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 this is what my observation, rather. Uh, Frank's father, as I'm sure you know, you know, you seem to know quite a bit about yeah. Frank. Yeah. Um, his father was a scientist. Yeah. He worked in... I know all about the defense. father, yeah. Yeah, Frank Sr. He was, uh, worked in... Oh. That's that, oh, Jerry. We maybe we remember when I showed you my archives. We had that article by Richie York in the Globe and Mail, where Frank describes. This is in '69. He's describing the making Uncle Meat, and it blew you away what he said. He said it's about a, a guy whose father is a government scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. not in the Uncle Meat package mm -hmm. that theme. Right. But right. it's exactly what he, he was talking about his father, yeah. his relationship with his father. Right. And all of the stuff that horrified Frank, I think, when he was at a real impressionable age, was. You know, the fact that there were gas masks hanging yeah. in the hall at home. It was like in a Nazi concentration camp yeah. or something, yeah. yeah. You know, and I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, a Freudian could have field day with Frank. I'm glad nobody has, you yeah. know. <laughs> but, there, yeah, there's a lot of things, I think, with him. I mean, just at a really critical point in his development, emotionally, he was just subjected to horror. Like Kafka. Kafka, I think, was one of Frank's favorite writers, and he yeah. read everything Kafka ever wrote. He didn't want to admit it to people, but he had. We had a long. And he read that when he was young in high school. Would you say? Probably a little later. I'd say he's probably in his twenties. Okay. Uh, and it, for him, it explained a lot of things because Kafka, I think, and Frank had something in common. They were both extremely capable of seeing things just extremely hyper realistically, right? Almost to the point where it looked like a hallucination, right? And it, the horror of it is brought back crystal clear just you know in, in such a way that you feel it but you transcend it and right now how does zircon relate to that is that well, his father zircon was kind of yeah the shadowy figure i mean maybe it started out being his dad coming home you know from yeah. work in a lab coat yeah and his dad working with mustard gas yeah and poison and, and poison all gas them. and ddt and all these weapons of death and destruction which is it in in like when the mother's like 66 65 there's a little ad and he he poses a question about poison gas, and you realize in retrospect mm -hmm. that was a motif. Yeah. Oh, which yeah. Which goes back to yeah, his father. Yeah. And where you really see a connection is um, prelude to the afternoon of a sexually aroused gas. Yeah. Here he's this teenage kid playing yeah. with his space helmet, yeah. the gas mask with a canister taken off. Yeah. And who knows what the hose reminds him of? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So you got a fertile field there. So does Doctor Zircon become Uncle Meat? Um, 
yeah. as, as yeah. that scientist sure. guy. Sure, Uncle Mead, like, who, who is, yeah, seen in the, not really seen in the film, but the, he's a little bit like the omniscient god type narrator. You don't ever see him, but his, right. his hand is felt, you know, all through the movie. And, you know, the little picture of him on the cover of the Grand Wazoo album, laboring in his secret lab, scratching right. his rash. I mean, With I books that Frank was reading with. right then. Dave Wallace, mm -hmm. I think he was reading right. Rise and Fall of yeah. Third Reich, yeah. right about when the you were there. Yeah. yeah, he was reading those books I'm that I'm surprised that the, uh, the Decameron, Boccaccio, wasn't there, too, because I was reading that to him. Because he had it in his library? It, no, I had it. You brought it. And, I was, and he loved it because it's like, you know, that, that sort of lowbrow, highbrow yeah. Italian thing, which he got, Frank got much more Italian as he got older, but he always was really Italian. And right. the humor in it, he just thought was terrific. And then he also liked all of the references to the Black Plague as, as a, That's why a force it, in people's do lives. Do you, in other words, you're telling me the first time when I suspected, I'm one of the few people who noticed when mm -hmm. it first came out, 1348 on the cover yeah, of. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Why? Yeah. And that was, the it was obviously plague. the plague date. Plague, yeah. So he had never really, he never studied the plague. Disease has fascinated him for some reason. And he does have a, a plague reference in one of the subtitles in Uncle Meat. But why yeah, did oh, the, the plague the fascinate plague. him? That was the clap, I think, huh? No, isn't it? It's the year, something yeah, about the year, the, the, year, the, year, the, year the plague. plague. But yeah. he wasn't talking about, I don't think he was talking about the black plague. I think he was talking about the clap. Do you think that yeah. Cal, since Cal made the, I talked to Cal back yeah. in 71. He yeah. made the album, maybe he put the 1348 in. He could have, he could have actually. But had he talked to Frank, what was Frank's fascination with the plague? Um, well, from what I could tell when I was reading the, the, the camera onto him, he couldn't believe that, I mean, you know, you live in modern times and they don't have the Black Plague anymore. Yeah. And he said, he had a horror, kind of a horror of uh, ancient history. He was fascinated by it, but horrified at the same time. That he time. wasn't living there. He was glad. He yeah. wasn't, you know, because, yeah, I mean, let's face it, I mean, things that, that uh, you know, now can be cured with penicillin were killing people left yeah. and right. You know, life was a short, nasty, and British and short kind of a thing. Um, and the Black Plague, the, the, the numbers who died, and the fact that, you know, the, the Decameron, of course, is being about a few people who had enough money to kind of get the hell out of it and kind yeah. of look down at Frank related, I think, to that vantage point that those people had. And what did they do? They went off and they played music and told stories. Uh -huh, yeah. And for a while he was kicking around in his mind, sort of, how can I uh, apply this to... Uh, a project. Yeah. You know, yeah. What, what's a modern plague? There was no AIDS or anything. Did then, he say that to you? It just didn't kind you of sketchy tell that outline. He was, mm, his mind I could was use kind this. of wheels yeah, returning, yeah. you know. And in a certain sense, it's kind of interesting. The uh, I find some kind of they're kind of ghastly parallels in uh, Civilization Phase Three. But to to what to we were kind of thinking yeah. about back then, because but look at the interval; it fits his yeah. whole pre uh, yeah. uh, preoccupation with AIDS yeah. and ending his right. biography with a higher form of right. killing. Right. That you're telling me where it came Maybe, from. Maybe, yeah, yeah, that could be the genesis of it. Yeah. You know? and he himself being ill and yeah. thinking about, you know, in a sense, like the doctors failed to protect him, so to speak. Right. He play. And see, it's yeah. like Doctor Zirkine again, the yeah. good, the bad of yeah. science. You know, there's a lot there. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now the doctor, the Uncle Meek Doctor Zircon is. Uh, he said, I, when I read it back then in 69, I said, oh, that's Frank, that's Frank, the high culture guy infiltrating mm -hmm. pop music. And he's mm -hmm. describing, he got the little mothers, room the jets, mm -hmm. and he put him out there and he had an experiment. He's going to run for president and all that stuff. <laughs> um, it, it, then it's, you then when you, the grandmothers and those people, they are wrestling. They kind of got used, they think, by Frank. Yeah, they, they do feel But that. I would say they got used by the, the dark side of Frank, which is the Dr. Zircon, mm -hmm. which he was like self-consciously admitting he had that agenda, but mm -hmm. he also wasn't that agenda. He was mm -hmm. a nice guy and he, he helped yeah. musicians. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So in Jungian terms, he was doing, that was the dark side that yeah. he said, you might think, you will eventually figure out that I'm, I have a dark side to me. So I'm actually talking to you about him already. Yeah. The, you know, the uncle yeah. made in that. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. The, um... Well, I mean, I think we have to be a little careful, too. We're assuming Frank was super conscious, hyper conscious of everything that he ever did. Well, but that's what, I, Frank and was a puzzle. He, yeah. See, I don't think anybody is. I mean, as bright and as brilliant and as talented as Frank was, he's still only human being. <laughs> and I, right. it took me years to accept that. That he wasn't as bright as... as well, no, that, not that he wasn't as bright, but that he's only a human being. Right, and but here's the thing. is that Jerry and I have talked about this for years. Fallible, in other words. He's oh, yeah, I don't mean he's... He, he has a huge disservice. He wrecked a whole generation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from other yeah. from oh, yeah. from Bernstein's point of view. I, I was yeah. Someone told me that when he and Bernstein met in 67, uh -huh. remember, Bernstein wouldn't talk to him. They, there was an animosity I'll there. I there was, yeah. And, uh, and there was, that may have been... Frank's anti, his image, well, don't he, go, bug Bernstein for the rest of my life kind of thing. Yeah, he wouldn't be able to look at himself in the mirror if he didn't do yeah. that. Yeah, so, and, and Bernstein represented the service and disservice of the other side, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But the, the the thing about Frank is after that 88 interview, is I knew he was he was being ornery, a contrarian oh at a certain point. Stubborn, yeah. And he, you see what, 
what was amazing, I bring up the symbolists. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking of Jari, but Jari yeah. would be included. He knew nothing about those guys. No. You know, he didn't know and any that, of that stuff. The one thing that made me almost want to contact him was when that book was published. My book With, on Alfred Jari. In 85? I wanted him to have a copy. In 84, I wanted him to have a copy. And I debated if I should just mail him one. I didn't do it. Uh, I thought, I tried to get hold of somebody that I had met in Switzerland through Frank, the guy yeah. who was in Zurich and used to put out a... a Urban Guerter. Urban Guerter, yeah. right. And I couldn't get hold of him. I'd lost track of him. He'd gone up in the mountains and was herding uh, uh, cattle and whatnot. Yeah, you know what he did? What happened to him? It, I got in touch with him in, say, 75, 76. Right, that was, yeah, because I knew him in 74 and 75, yeah. 76. Do you remember, did he tell, what happens, he put on a, sh did you ever get his Hot Rats magazine? Yeah, I have a whole run of it, actually. Okay, remember when? I contributed to it, as a matter of fact. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have it. Yeah. I'll have to, what, under Go your back. name? Yeah. There's several things. Geez, maybe that's why your name's familiar. It could be, I never yeah. knew why it was familiar. Well, Urban told me a funny story. We never spoke directly. It was all by correspondence, yeah. which I thought was very surreal. You know, uh, he had a standing invitation to go and, and stay there if I ever wanted to go, but I never made it there. But I'd done my European job by that point. But um, uh, he told me. How did me you hear about him, Frank? Oh, Frank told you Frank, about that. Yeah. yeah. So um, you wrote to him and then... So I wrote him and, you know, he was very glad to write back because he liked to keep in touch with people in Frank. But he told me a hilarious story. He said the first time that uh, he'd ever heard of me, Frank did a, a really surprising thing. He was talking about something totally random and he pulled out his wallet and there was a picture of me in there and he held out the picture and just didn't say anything. He just showed him to, to Urban and that was the end of it. And Urban said, well, who's that? And somebody later told him, well, that's somebody named I.G. Lennon who used to play in the band. And he doesn't know why Frank showed it at that yeah. point. No, there was no explanation. It was like a nonverbal communication. Yeah. Well, the, the, yeah. the, that, that's my problem. Yeah. My yeah. problem. Uh, who <laughs> Who's knows? the enemy? The women yeah. are kidding. Yeah. 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 Kill. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Zirkan on the world. Well, that's a very good story. It was then. strange. I mean, yeah. that that alone was really an interesting way to kind of get to know Urban. And I, so he knew, he saw an image of you, and yeah. then Frank got you to write him, and then you corresponded. Right. And then, then I started to, I kind of contributed by, you know, he needed somebody here who kind of could keep tabs on what was going on with the scene. You know. Of Urban. Uh, yeah, Urban. Oh, Urban needed Wanted someone. somebody here, kind of. Yeah. Thing. So here's what happened in... Yeah. in, uh, in so anyway, so yeah, where, where did he... Yeah, I, I know that. There's something you know that, that I can fill you in on this. Great. Uh, I got in touch with him in, say, late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'm not sure if it was 76, 77, but here's what happened. I knew about him. Mm -hmm. Dave Wally told me about him. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to him on the phone. And then... You know who I met? I came here in 77, and I met through the Zappa Network, Matt Graney. Oh, yeah. When he first came here and was doing the Xeroxing. And he Xeroxed all the Hot Rats times for me. Uh-huh. Okay. In that 77, 78 period, I read there's a whole issue about Frank coming to Zurich, or one of those places mm -hmm. in yeah. Switzerland, sure. and, and uh, Zurich w and Urban was putting on a whole art show. Yeah, he did that, right. Right? Mm -hmm. But what did Frank do? Do you remember what he did? You know, I never, I, I heard there was some kind of trouble, but I don't remember now what He did, was. Frank he didn't, didn't show up. He didn't go, yeah. That was and it. Urban, that it's crushed Urban. Pissed, he, yeah. It was like his own image in the Zurich art community. He what? was presenting Frank in the gallery, he laid out whatever was the, con mm -hmm. the, the content of the gallery, all the Zappa stuff, mm -hmm. and he wanted the you know, coup de grace to have Frank show sure. up, and yeah. thank you urban frank did not come yeah. now probably matt told me that i believe it because there yeah. was there was some kind no, of a, no, a cooling yeah, off yeah no, ahead, yeah sorry. i'm just saying i first heard about it with matt then i contacted urban mm -hmm. and he told me about this the whole story and he was pissed and he and that that mm -hmm. shocked him mm -hmm. his idol failed yeah. so he almost said screw civilization and he went into husbandry that made sense okay. yeah he went into yeah. the country yeah he definitely became a recluse so that's right he couldn't be gotten hold of by actually him. another damaged victim of frank on yeah. a certain level but frank really really was a problem for urban as i understood maybe our urban would not have that was his life Right, Frank was his life. He was a brilliant guy, and that was his life. How about Frank. Craig Pincus? You know Craig. I don't. I know. I've heard of him, yeah. but I don't know. He did that Mother's Journal. Right. Journal. Right. He was another guy who just disappeared. Yeah. And I called him in the late seventies. Said, "Can I get your back issues?" Mm -hmm. And he sort of said, "Yeah, I'll try to find them." But he said, "I don't want to." He says, well, "Frank, that's anymore. an old old yeah. period." But he did tell me some interesting stories that he got. Frank gave him contacts as a lawyer in the music industry, and he got to uh, represent a lot of Motown guys or something. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and Frank. Gayish, but he but he said when I was first doing Mother's Home Journal, I did not know Frank. When I met Frank, mm -hmm. as a result of that, and got to know him, then I realized I had a different image. Mm -hmm. the, my image did not match the person. Right. And then maybe he learned some bad things, but he always complimented Frank for giving him the industry connections in mm -hmm. in, law, in mm -hmm. law, being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But Gwerter, 
he really was hurt and he dropped everything and went into yeah. animals. What was he, gathering animals? It was, he was, it was like a Noah's Ark operation. Yeah, cow herding, really. Just sort of taking him up on the side of the mountain and letting him, you know, letting the herd. Feed yeah, him. maybe he thought the apocalypse yeah. was coming. And it he was won. dairy. It's not dairy. It's not like, you know, like my family was in cattle ranching, you know, right. for meat, right? Yeah. Just ship him, ship him, you know, the stockyards kind of thing. He wasn't doing that. He was that. doing the, the, the dairy kind of angle. Yeah, and I think he was even yeah. into herbs and things. Yeah. And oh, yeah, sure. he was like really into naturalism. He right? was the ultimate hippie in yeah, that Yeah, he sense. really was. Yeah. He was a neat guy. I like that. I mean, what I, I'd never talked to him, and yet I had such a clear picture of who he was. Right. So that that's what happened. Yeah. That gallery thing caused it. And you heard a bit about that. Yeah, because yeah. I have all that stuff. And he was he was really delicate. I mean, in a cer certain sense, he was kind of discreet about it. He didn't, I guess, didn't want to hurt hurt yeah. me or, you know, kind of cast aspersions on Frank, who he could have done it and it wouldn't have bothered me in the least, you know. Yeah, that's why he was the own. ultimate decent so, hippie. You yeah, know, he, he was pretty decent. And he wouldn't, even he so got, That's interesting to hear the end of the story because I, I knew he had just totally distanced himself from that whole milieu. If I had a letter it. from him at home that I read, uh, it was one of the last ones he sent me probably before he went away forever to the Alps, you know. And that's and the we, last you have that you heard from him. That's the end. 1976, I don't remember the month. But right. Was, you know. Now, why, why were we talking about Gwerder? I because we I wanted, it. when I uh, wrote, when, the, when I published oh, yeah. Dr. Jury in 84, I wanted to get a copy to Frank, and I thought, I wanted to get a copy to Urban, too, because he was a big Jari person, and understood him just beautifully without yeah. being that polyglot sensibility. But, um... Uh, so I, I, I debated whether I should send the uh, the book to Frank, and I never did it. And I kind of wish I had, because he, he if he hadn't been in one of his perverse moods, he would have loved it. Right. <laughs> well, he says in his biography that uh, that someone told him that he was a dadist. He didn't know yeah. about data. Yeah. And you know, was that you? or? No, it wasn't me, although I had a sense of him being that way. I just thought he knew all about the movement. But he because didn't. Vares was involved in the Donna movement That's in right. New York. Yeah, you assumed he knew in seventy one when you were with him. Right. And you never you never found out he didn't know. Right. Until he told you in the biography. Right. And yeah. Right. Yeah, that was curious. That's where mm -hmm. Frank was of the street. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's where he was a dog. He was like an yeah. amazing, intelligent <laughs> dog who didn't need any education. Right. He was gonna do he knew how to think, he knew how to survive, he knew how to make things. Why did he need anything? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and who needs history and who needs, yeah. you know, for precedent? And, and then you think of his sort of maybe best friend, the guy who who sort of did that, who who didn't have anything. Frank mm -hmm. had just he was a Catholic church kid, he mm -hmm. went through society, and then he dropped out in a sense. Yeah. Beefart was always on the outside. So he was <laughs> yeah, on yeah. his way to meeting Beefart. Yeah. And they both were dogs. They kinda of both met in the middle. Yeah, of, yeah. Of the, they met know, in the middle. Right, sniffing around the curb. Yeah. Know, and guess. the myth is yeah. Beefart didn't go to school, he was there, but right. the myth was that he was like a wild kid. Yeah. What do they call that movie? Yeah, a feral kid, yeah, yeah. A feral? Yeah, that's like when a when an animal kinda of goes back to the wild. So right. Yeah. yeah. But what was that yeah. movie, The Wild Child? Well, the Wild Child. Yeah, yeah. he presented himself. Yeah. Was that way. Well, that's kind of yeah. That's what Don. And the thing about Don that's really amazing too um, is that that is so natural with him. I mean, it's, yeah. he doesn't put on anything. He's just he's so just natively eccentric that it's just now there's really the difference between mind. Frank and yeah, Don. No, Frank knew how to how to put on a, a certain. It wasn't that he was a phony, but yeah, it, it's different. It no, was Frank calculated. Was, the difference yeah. is that Don wouldn't mind living in the plague zone he yeah. could have survived yeah. frank was afraid his fussiness was afraid of oh, the plague. Yeah. Yeah. he loved technology he was the inventor right. he was the gadget lover right and right. that was the difference between him and don sure and the control thing too because don didn't control anything and right. <laughs> couldn't even oh, i had the funniest thing one time i remember um we went up to the he had to put gas in his volvo he got a new volvo i think his, his in-laws his wife's parents gave would that be about 77 is that what he drove me 75 in? yeah 75 and this was when he was doing the thing with uh, Frank for the Bongo Fury yeah. tour. And we went up to the corner to get, he had to get gas. And I don't think he did it a whole lot with that car. I mean, you know, the tank was empty and whatever. Maybe his wife put the gas in the car. Yeah. He was, it was, it, it would have been funny if it, had, if it hadn't been sort of kind of sad. He was totally at a loss of, you know, how you... Uh, put you know the nozzle in the tank, <laughs> unscrew the cap, put the, uh, uh, and it was just all these things. I could see his mind racing. You know, is this like, his incident? You're describing the book. I don't know, it's not in the book. It's not. Oh, it's, but it's that period. But it was that period yeah. during Bongo Fury. Yeah. And he couldn't. He couldn't. Um, he couldn't do, do it. So I, I finally kind of. I was a little delicate about it. I said, Here, Don. This this thing looks pretty cantankerous. You know. Here, let me do it. And, you know, you go pay the guy. And I, I think we can do this. You know. So we. I put the gas in for him, and it was like. <laughs> It's totally space. Yeah, that, that you got a pun in there. Can tanker it? Can tank tanker it? Oh, I'll can the tank tanker it. Yeah, exactly. yeah. No, the yeah. the dialectic between him and Frank was really interesting. Um, when I drove, when I was with him in the car, it, though, 
When I went out to Lancaster and got in there, and then we drove back to a mm -hmm, rehearsal mm -hmm. in 70, October 77. Right, that must have taken you forever. He drove so slow. Right. It was nice about an hour drive into yeah, Van Noyes. Yeah. Or Van Nuys. Van Nuys. <laughs> Van Nuys. Yeah, that would be yeah, yeah, the actual yeah. pronunciation. Yeah. And uh, he was very sober. Mm -hmm, and a mm -hmm. different person. He was almost like, like a, oh, yeah. a business person. We're driving <laughs> in there, you know, totally opposite yeah. of the guy I met before. Oh, yeah. And we talked, I asked him, I said, he had knocked Frank in 72, 73. Then in 75, when the Bongo Fury says, Frank's the greatest, it was in Rolling Stone, the most creative person on the planet. He, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Some people say, He always oh, zipped backwards, right. bang and bang and bang, one, one extreme to the other. Right, but yeah. people would say, oh, well, you're working Frank, he's got to praise right, the boss. Yeah. But when I, I asked him about this, I laid it out mm -hmm. to him, and, he, and I said, is this a Mott and Jeff routine that you guys are doing almost as joking? He says, yeah. Yeah. In other words, he, he was above, he, yeah, he, he Frank under understood mm -hmm. the way to play it off each other for, mm -hmm. for media yeah. reasons. They, well, they could say it was definitely an old rivalry from high school days. Yeah. And you know, you know how it is when you go to high school with somebody and they know all, they've been around for years, they know everything about you back when you were grubby, snot-nosed, yeah. nothing, you know. <laughs> That's they both, they knew, both knew, you know, yeah, Don, I remember when you were fat and pale and you sat in your room drinking Pepsi all day and eating, you know, and you can, stale baked goods from his dad's bread truck. Right, and you know what, Frank was like, what when Frank was dying in the last few months, Don, 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 Don was calling him. Yeah. Now, do you know what Frank would, what I've been told mm -hmm. is that Frank, after Don would call, he'd act like a little kid. He'd say, geez, Don called me. I, it was so great. And he'd go on and on like a little kid. In other words, that basic <laughs> yeah. friendship rivalry it began with Don, it ended with Don. Yeah, you know that's what I mean? right. Yeah. And yet he was, in a, maybe he was more passive and not as aggressive, he was resigned to dying. Mm -hmm. And so he just loved Don as a little kid, yeah. himself as a kid, his buddy calling him. Yeah. That's an interesting, that's, have you heard of that? No, it's a nice story though. Yeah, that, that they that. did get back yeah. together. And Frank was almost like, it sounded like Don was the guru. And Frank was so glad my, my priest called me today, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and he's helping me, you know? Yeah, it's funny because when, when he was, I heard that he was seriously ill, that there wasn't much hope for him really as early as it was 90, it was 91. Yeah. They and announced it in 91, don't they, Jerry, in, the, in November 91 at that, the yeah. Zappa Universe? And yet it yeah. was out in the local paper in 90, late yeah, 90. Yeah, it was floating around, but I heard, I mean, I actually got, because a friend of, a good friend of mine is, uh, her boss at work was Ralph Humphrey's old girlfriend from the yeah. band many years ago. And she kept up with what was going on, you know, at home with Frank and stuff, and it was, um, uh, apparently he got like one really horrible diagnosis from from the doctor like there's nothing we can do that would and be in early 90 89 that was like 91 yeah i mean oh, that was it i mean yeah. that was it there was nothing they could do it's all over you it's, just we'll just see how long you live yeah now. is it going to be a year is going to be two is it well you know you hang, hang in there for three more but uh yeah anyway so and you know my friend told me this we were out having dinner you know and she was sitting there because <laughs> she didn't know the extent of how much i'd been involved with frank she just see, you we say in the book, close. nobody knew, nobody really. Knew. I didn't talk about it. Of your new life once, yeah. once you 85 and a journalist and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, yeah. post Frank. After, really, after 75, 76, I didn't talk about Frank. Anybody who... Yeah. And it was because it was a problem for you. Once in a while, like, I had Don's picture of me on the wall at home, that portrait of me that he drew. It's in the book, actually. Yeah, right. You had that. Yeah. And it, people would see that it said Don Netflix. Was that Captain <laughs> You know, and... Um, um, but you, you know, would not encourage it. But I wouldn't, really, it. I wouldn't go into big, lengthy things about it. So, <laughs> um, anyway, so when I heard that, it was like really, my thought was, geez, you know, I haven't seen Frank in all these years. I wonder if I should go up and just, you know, I thought yeah. about it a lot. Should I, you know, make an attempt to go up there and, you know, just, but then what would I say? You know, are you gonna, why didn't I talk about this stuff before? I mean, when somebody's, you know, dying, yeah, yeah. that's a heavy load to lay on them. Right. I forgive you. Yeah. Isn't that why to you? you know? yeah. So you're yeah. saying that you so, know, Ralph Humphrey's uh, friend yeah, was, um, told you that serious statement. You yeah. don't say that in here, I don't think. But yeah, that's when you found out that yeah. it was bad. Yeah, I just right over. at the end of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you don't and say And I know. kind of, it was almost like I was on a, uh, unconsciously in a sense, uh, a little bit of a death watch. I kept waiting for bad news. And somebody did tell me something that happened. And I just had a sense. My whole body kind of went onto alert, even though this wasn't happening in a really hyper-conscious way. But I could just sort of feel... I wasn't very well myself, strangely enough, that same period. I had... I'm still not sure. I had a really bad infection and knocked out my whole lymphic system. And I had no immunity, and I just I felt like shit all the time. I was kind of like giddy and dizzy and tired. And, yeah. You know, just really feeling crappy. And nobody could tell me what was really the matter. This is 91, 92? Yeah, 91, yeah. 92 and into 93. So that was yeah. another reason why you didn't have the energy to go. Just, you had your own problem. Yeah, but in a certain sense. Now, see, if I were mystical, mystically inclined, I'd say almost like maybe some of Frank's energy kind of got into me. Right, yeah. Because it was really mysterious. I've never, I'm not a sick person. I've never been sick a day in my life. Now, did you and, get sick after you found out he was sick? 
uh, really about the same time. Yeah, and I so can't tell you for sure if it was before or after, but it was right in that same So a synchronicity period. factor yeah. there. Yeah, there was. And I could feel somehow that he, the, what he was feeling like. It was really strange. Um, I should have put some of that in the book, actually, come to think of it. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so a a after okay, 75, yeah. you leave Frank. You, you're, mm -hmm. I guess you're, you're kind of angry. You say, look, I, there's no, deal, no problem. <laughs> there's no, no way to deal with Frank. I'm a, i got to start a new life. So there's no words to describe it. because When you got married, yeah, that's another thing. That was, yeah, that was a whole other thing. But... Um, there was no words to describe how I felt. I was, I was angry. I was just, like, kind of like I felt a little kind of taste of it in New York when Frank kind of told me, you know, I had to leave the tour. Yeah. I felt sort of like I was dying. I really felt like even oh, in like it happened again in '75. Only worse because yeah. it ended so so badly, and it was didn't make any sense. It's a little bit like that thing probably that Irving Guerter felt when yeah. Frank didn't show up for the the thing, and it wouldn't have been any big deal for him to do it. You know, it's like. You realize, well, with me, with a lot of reflection on it, I realized that I had just put too much into my relationship with Frank. As right. important as he was, I had to let go. Right. And it was a, but it wasn't easy. Okay, so then you start corresponding with Gwerder. Seven, you're, you're in yeah. touch with Gwerder. Yeah. So do you then, what did you focus on? Writing music or, or Jari? What did you do from 76 to 80, say? Um... I did music. I did some music. I had a couple of bands, and I wrote a lot of stuff. You and played in yeah. clubs? And I, yeah, yeah. I Professional played. musician? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I also wrote. I did a lot of freelance writing articles, mostly, um, for different publications. Did National you ever know Lita Lescu? No. Uh, which I want to find Lita. Do you know the name? Mm -hmm. Lita Lescu, mm -hmm. a music reviewer for the East Village Other, mm -hmm. which might be mm -hmm. before your time in the, in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. But then she was living out here in Woodland Hills and wrote for music uh, mm -hmm. magazines. Mm -hmm. You don't don't know that mm -hmm. name? I sure don't. Okay, so so you, were re you wrote reviews yourself? Yeah. I, well, I didn't write much on music, really. I did... Um, the kind of places I wrote for were places typically like that was the beginning of the alternative newspaper period uh, you know before there were underground papers no you mean papers. The, the, the LA Weekly like the, the Weekly the Reader was the, the sort weekly. of so acceptable yeah. suburban kind right. of right they were you know they were more conventional than underground yeah but they still supposedly you know and it was great I was able to write like one of the articles I wrote was about Beefheart in 1980 um, he had really passed into a, a total eclipse. People but he came back in 1980. Came, yeah. yeah. And I was really glad because I think that that article did a lot of good because nobody was writing about him in those days. Oh, I'd like to read that. You have to well, I'll send get you a copy. Send, yeah, send give it me to your Jerry here. Yeah. Yeah, and we can... Uh, yeah, I'd like to get some of your stuff as well. I'd like to read some right. of his interviews and things too. Yeah, but, right, so, um, you, so you're saying you were on the, the counterculture, mainstreaming of counterculture, writing for those kind yeah, of magazines. Yeah, those kind of places. And, I also wrote a lot for the Herald Examiner Sunday Magazine um, and the op-ed page too. On what? Uh, any all kinds of articles, or so in whatever, the counter -culture? You know, people kind of tend to when you're doing freelance writing, people tend to type you, and I did cultural stuff a lot. I, I mean, actually, I've always been interested in architecture and you know history, um, Western history. From that, it kind of moved into. Uh, I really got more and more fascinated with Western history. Not that I had ever not been, but it became a real focus for me. You had today. time to read. Yeah. Uh, not you know, on the road. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, it, let's face it, I wasn't making a lot of money, and, you know, my, my time was kind of looser in those days. I wasn't, you know, working at a job or anything. And so um, in, uh, like, the late 70s, uh, in 1980, I wrote a, my first Mark Twain book, which is called Mark Twain in California, which is pub published by Chronicle. And I did about a year's worth of research on that, going to different, you know, like the Bancroft Library, the Mark Twain Papers, and uh, just any place, where, right. any repository where they had stuff on, on Twain in the West in the 1860s. And got really, really fascinated by that, and it kind of took me off in a whole other direction. So so this was your yeah. literary self. I mean, you had your yeah. musical self, and yeah. then you had your literary self. So yeah. you <laughs> dropping your musical self. You did your bands, but dropping your intellectual input into conceptual stuff that well, Frank represented right. went into literary. I noticed one thing, too. With the, the end of my relationship with Frank, I stopped writing orchestra music of any sort. And did um, you ever do it again? Uh, when I, I had a period, actually, in the was it the late 70s about 78 79 somebody gave me a beautiful not gave me but let me store a really beautiful concert grand an eight eight and a half foot concert grand and um it was in my apartment in silver lake and i i did pick out i got all my old orchestra scores out and kind of played through them and you know rewrote spots in them but you know the truth is when you're writing that stuff if you want to hear it played good luck yeah it's just the economics are really dismal so so you haven't written much but, on that way. Yeah, no, hardly at all. So you went more writing books, not yeah. journalism yeah. things. Yeah, and thinking thinking more about larger pictures because when I was working on music, my my view of necessity was a bit small. It was very practical. It was, you know, I'm writing this piece. Well, how am I going to get this done? 
who, who am I going to get to play it? How's that going to work? You know, yeah. that sort of thing. The funny problem, yeah. You mean yeah. Frank could get it done, and Nuts look at the problems and he had. Nuts and bolts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what was your <clears throat> what was your husband doing in that seventy five to eighty? Was he writing for the LA Free Press or? Was that um, you were doing. Let's see, jobs. Some jobs. He had a couple of. We both freelance for the LA Times. Yeah, the LA Times. In fact, that was he wrote a, a book. That the genesis of the book Literary LA was the late 70s. Uh, they were all articles that appeared originally in the Herald Examiner in the ma Sunday Magazine. We had a good deal with the Sunday Magazine uh, of the Examiner for a while, uh, like almost a year. Each of us had a guaranteed article in there every week, one or the other of us. So they kept us afloat and they enabled us to do a lot of good writing, but also a lot of other things as well. And so it's kind of so you, yeah, as baby yeah. boomers, you became uh, <laughs> a, a mainstream journalist a little bit. Kind of, yeah. yeah. So there was a period where you could do that. It isn't yeah. like it is now. It's pretty dismal now. Right. right. So then in, from 80 to 85, what, what happened? <clears throat> um, early 80s, I was doing still a lot of freelancing, and I finally kind of petered out on that in about 83, I would say. Mark Twain book was out. Now, were you um, doing research in Jari all along? Well, building up, or um, did you do it without a one six month project? Mm, no, that, I'll get to that in a second. Mm, that was okay. an interesting thing. In '83, I met Bill Griffith, who yeah. was in Hollywood. In fact, I met Bill Griffith because I had an assignment to interview him for the LA Reader. I'll tell you some other reader stories in a minute that would have to do with Matt Groening, which you will find, I think, pretty mind-boggling since you like confluence. I know Matt. Yeah, you know Matt. Is, is that who he wrote for, the LA Reader? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I looked yeah. up Matt in 1980, yeah. well, and you, he was just driving, uh, delivering the newspaper. He was a pencil sharpener. Right, right. and then started. shortly after that he made the little break yeah. with his girlfriend or something. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, it's a bit... Well, I'll tell you first about that. Yeah. <laughs> How I met Bill Griffith and got into writing The Man with the Axe. Bill was... Here, uh, writing, rewriting a screenplay, and they put him up in the Chateau Marmont, and the bungalow. It turned out where John uh, Belushi had just died the week before. Right. And I, you know, he moved quickly out of the bungalow into the main hotel, and I went and we did an interesting interview, a couple of hours, three hours or so on. And during that interview, it came out. I never met Bill before, although I certainly knew his work and liked it a great deal. Um, he had uh, always had a fascination with Alfred Jarry. He did a little uh, bio, cartoon bio with him, like back 10 years earlier, like about 72 or something. And um, anyway, so we hatched up a plot over the ensuing weeks after the article came out. I interviewed him for Playboy, and that appeared. And then we kind of both hit on the same thing at the same time. Let's do a Classics Illustrated biography of Alfred Jarry. Really? Yeah. So we did. Now, because, because he realized you <laughs> knew enough about him and were interested? Well, because he didn't feel like a book-length illustrated bio would, would go. He just didn't think it would be that great a book. And so what, I could write what, the text, he could do the pictures. Oh, he wanted more text. Yeah. So what's it we called? Both, a classic, classic? Yeah, well, I would like, you know, Classics Illustrated, they used to do car like right. comic book bios. Where That's what of, he was thinking he couldn't do. Well, I, I, I was being kind of humorous, actually. Uh, Look at it. What it. I always called it Classics Crucified, because, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so but I what, we, what we were striving to do was to basically bring Jarry to life in a, uh, you know, a little bit like what Frank might have done if he had been interested in, in dead, you know, proto Dada is. Right. Uh, it's, it's a very vernacular, very colloquial sort of a book. It's full of, like, current references. It's an American. It's like the first, really, American biography of Jarry. Um so that's the point. He didn't want to do the comic, but he found someone who could write and right. make it more right, more right. Text Neither of us really, yeah. Neither of us really struggled with the logistics that much. We just said this is something we want to do. You have a writer, you have a great illustrator, and a good writer, and let's let's do this. And in the middle of that period, you heard from John, John Vanderdust. Yeah, I met him at towards the end of it because I had uh, been at the uh, uh, American Booksellers Association convention here in Anaheim. And uh, as a matter of fact, that was the first time I actually saw Bill Griffith. It was at, it was that was a kind of a big time because I, I met I sort of said hi to him because he had the booth across from where I was. Yeah, it's a long story, but anyway, and uh, went and did the interview and all that. But um, at the same time, I, I made contact with one of the fellows whose name I can't remember. I'm afraid of the College des Pères de Physique, who is in the French publications sector of the book convention. And he got kind of, I don't know, I forgot what it was. I sort of mentioned this as almost a joke. Hey, I think I'm going to write an English language book about Alfred Jarry. And you hadn't talked to Bill about it yet? Um, I sort of had yeah, just okay, really... so you know, it was Berkeley. Yeah, I was yeah. kind of kicking around. It was obviously fertile, you know, for that, that idea. But 
anyway, so this guy kind of mm, mm. took a look and it, he made a mental note. So anyway, he, I guess, went back to Paris. And told John the, was, was a member. Yeah, John was still in Paris. And he said, hey, there's someone over there. Somebody's thinking about it. Yeah, 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 we got to put us. Plots and schemes. Yeah, John, you, you, you become our handler. <laughs> right. And by the time John came over to, to L.A., it was uh, probably a year later. After the book came out. And the book was out. And yeah. It was just absolutely hilarious. I thought, you know, he kind of, John was very secretive about why he wanted to, to come over and stuff. And we said, hey, you need a place to stay, you know, you can crash on our couch. And we just, like, made the house open to him and took him out to dinner, came back, and the boys uh, smoked a little bit of material. And we played, I had just done, a friend of mine had a wonderful looking period diner in Silver Lake called Millie's. It looked like about 1930. So we had shot, he starred in it, and I had a guy that looked really bizarre, play Jari, and we did a music video, like a, it was a satire of a music video, it was like a rap tune, Alfred Jari, the man with the axe, which was promoting the book. Now where did you do it that this time? This was right at that same time. John, John was, was there. there. Yeah, it was right after we'd shot it, and I had the film, and I also had the, uh, the music, and I played in the music, and I realized John was a, a great person because he, not only did he get it, he was just laughing until the tears were running yeah, down yeah, his yeah. cheeks. <laughs> you know. So anyway, we became friends as a result of that. And then he told me the whole plot from the, the, the college. Oh, how? You, yeah, it's a secret society. Yeah, yeah. It's, and you know they, they don't like people that, that are starting up what look like competing organizations. Yeah, this yeah. organization, you got to be kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is bureaucratized. That is. <laughs> if yeah. this was exactly if yeah. this was an organization, Captain Beefheart would be the president for life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. No, yeah. So you didn't know why he, there was this intrigue. Until right. John told right. you. Right, then John finally yeah. came clean about it, and it was just, we all had to get laugh about it. Yeah, you can't become a member. You get asked to be yeah, a member. Right. You don't oh. even know it exists. Yeah. This is, it's like, intel it's a miming and intelligence organization. Yeah, it was hilarious. Yeah. I it was just great. But anyway, yeah, so, so that, that's how, so, anyway, so, okay, that, that brings us up to, like, 85. And then you get into the B'nai B'rith? And then I was working, yeah, Lionel was working at the Mass, the Messenger, and uh, that funny thing happened with the, the PMRC and Frank. Right. Um, okay, um, now, the, what interactions um, uh, did you have with the LaRouche organizi organization in that period? Because they were very controversial with Proposition 86. Mm -hmm. And I know the, yeah. they were gone down in the ADL. The ADL doesn't like them. Do, did you, were, as you being part of a Jewish paper, was mm -hmm. there much of that interaction with the LaRouche problem? Um, I didn't see it. Did, was that a problem? I, I, I was, you know, being editor of the mess was always interested in the roof but no they, they never they, read, they never attacked you wrote articles about you or things because they do that in their newspaper yeah i'm sure they they, they do i mean i, I also was people. maybe it's an orthodox question yeah what no, do you say this is an orthodox paper but i myself am an atheist and a socialist and they really put up with me as the editor partly because i was pretty good at it but also because i'm related to the rebbe Schnerzen. Mm. And so the guy in New York? Yeah, yeah. just died. The guy who just died. Well, yeah. the menu and the family is all. They're all Schnerzen. related. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, and I wrote a book about it. But um, um, So you had so a bit of status wasn't. in there. In yeah, that sense. I, I mean, the truth is, anybody who really pushed me could tell that I wasn't your typical Jewish, uh, you know, uh, your basic socialist revolutionary right. in the work. <laughs> So they talk, and what happened? You you met you went up but to meet Don? No. What? Yeah, he. Uh, That's Lionel in seventy five though. Yeah, that was back in seventy five yeah. during the Bongo Fury period. And, right. Um, I was my I was rapidly approaching dissolution with the whole thing. Yeah. Well, I, I I knew Nigel right at the end of that period, and Ruth Underwood lived at their house for a while. Right. So when you met Don in seventy five, at that at that wedding. Wedding. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of Don? You know, oh, as a socialist I, Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked him. I mean, we stayed up all night. You know, it was a good. Was he? Uh, did you find him a bizarre? Or were you were you sympathetic mentally with yeah, him? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, yeah they you, got along great. Actually. Yeah. So you you had any anarchist I, I liked I liked Don a lot better than I liked Zappa. Actually. Yeah. And I also it's thought Don. I also thought Don was actually a genius, and Zappa wasn't. Yeah, that's the, the paradox about the two of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean. Yeah. In productivity, Frank's a genius, yeah. you know. But Don represents something, and it, that's the dialectic that I'm always working on. Yeah. So, yeah. so you do you want to add something to that dialectic, or have we already discussed it in a way? We talked about yeah. it. Yeah. But yeah, so you you that's what everybody wondered, you know, which which came first, first Don or Frank? You know, <laughs> in the age, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you you side on Don's. You take Don's side. Yeah. But well, I, I mean, remember, I basically like classical music only, and. and yeah, a little bit of jazz. So that's so why you didn't like Frank. <laughs> yeah, so you don't, you're not going to get seduced by the the, the rock beat. No. We'll return with Nigel Lennon and Bob Dobbs in a moment. This is really good. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm getting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's actually interesting. Yeah. 
You're getting what? Um, well, it was sort of strange, I think. I mean, Nigel says that she didn't have any contact with Zappa, actually, during that period. That was going to come to that, yeah. actually, yeah. Uh, no, wait a minute. I, I just said, um, this is great. And then you yeah. you were <laughs> commenting on me saying, by saying, uh, that's too bad. Or what, what? No, what he was going to say yeah. was uh, he was going to tell a story about at the messenger in the PRMRC. Okay, so yeah, yeah. you want to tell it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. If, if you could just sit maybe right here, okay. or, you know, sit at here so this mic can pick it up. So you Bob, can't refrain from talking <laughs> too loud while he's talking right. and interrupting because i got to ride the level. Right. But you okay so far? So you got the energy to keep going? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. Bob, just say, we now we return. I don't. With, you do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could. No. <laughs> and, and, and Lionel... Lionel... Rolf. 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 Oh, Rolf will join us. Okay. Let me see. We now, re now return with Nigel Lennon, Bob Dobbs, and we're joined with... And introduce yourself. I'm Lionel Rolf. I'm uh, Nigel's husband and also a writer and editor and all that sort of thing. And for about ten years I edited the B'nai B'rith Messenger, and one day this uh, uh, lady comes with a story about the PMRC saying that it was had anti-Semitic components. Uh, I didn't you know, I wasn't all that motivated because I'm not a big rock and roll fan. But it, it was it was a good yarn, and so I said, you know, so she wrote a few pieces about the anti-Semitism of the PMRC, and during that period, and of course she was dealing directly with Frank all that time, and I'd known Frank briefly towards the end of Nigel's uh, relationship with him. And so one day I uh, interviewed him for The Messenger, and he invited both of us to come up to the house and I guess I wasn't too anxious to <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> couldn't blame you, yeah. Um, you know, um, so we never really and then I did talk to Nigel about it and she she wasn't Well actually just, yeah, Lionel tried to convince me to do it. He said you I? really yeah, you did. He said, you know, you really ought to at least give him a call and say hi because he sounded like he really wanted to hear from you and I said, Well, you know, it's not easy to let the past, you know, go away and stay there. It's, uh, you know, too much stuff would be coming well, up. I was also the one who encouraged Nigel when Zappa died to write the piece yeah, because yeah. I could see she was really upset yeah. and, and yeah. it very easily developed into yeah. a book and I, I was hoping it would get rid of all the Zappa stuff. Instead <laughs> 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 okay. of so now you said you went up. Did you go? No. No, I, just, didn't I, go. I, I interviewed, interviewed him by phone. Yeah, uh, I talked mm -hmm. to him by phone and so that would have been so, so if you we did were, go. So what's sort of a the strange thing of an Orthodox Jewish newspaper? I think it's the one of the oldest papers in Los Angeles. Um, uh, Orthodox Jewish newspaper being sort of um, you know a pipeline for anti PMRC stuff, and right. I got a kick out of that. I mean, it, it made you know the perverse part of me feel. <laughs> <laughs> so so you and it would have been an opportunity for Nigel to see Frank again if you had gone up. If you had yeah, gone sure, to see Frank, sure. yeah. right? But yeah. and you, you sort of blocked it, or you blocked it? No. Oh. Well, Lionel wasn't super anxious. He he brought it, was it up. Mutual. Yeah. He said, well, "If you want to go, we'll go." go. Yeah. And you said no, I and that supported his yeah. view. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the end. And, yeah. So the uh, so we're talking about uh, so what what would you say? How would you characterize the dialect between Don and Frank? Would you talk a bit about that? I mean, you favor Don. Well, I just my basic impression. I, I was a little, you know, partly I suppose it was uh, some jealousy when I first met Nigeria. I was attracted, and here she was, all, you know, obsessed with this fucking rock and roll musician. Yeah. Um, from my standpoint. Yeah. Um, who actually, I guess, kind of liked me. Um, In fact, I think Lionel might be the only person who Frank liked better than that person liked him. Really, yeah. and and this, yeah. because you had met him. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, he met him on a lot of occasions, and, occasions had all kinds and, of and I guess that what I was actually kind of upset about him with it, it was how he treated his musicians, because I grew up with chamber music, where the musicians really respect each other and work with each other. And, and well, the, you, with chamber music, you work on an intuitive level. Yeah, and it's very and, high level. And, and but I, how did you know yeah. Frank uh, through Nigel? But when did you meet Nigel? We actually met. We met in '73, I think. Yeah. Okay, so you had some interaction with Frank and saw this from '73 to '79. Oh, yeah, you actually, yeah, yeah Lionel. Okay. Like yeah. Okay, so you yeah. didn't like the way he uh, treated musicians. Yeah, that really upset me quite a yeah. bit. Yeah. And and um, um, you know, I was just 
also, I, I think the parts of him that were too much like an avant-garde composer got on my nerves a lot because I, I have a you know you're a populist a, in a sense, and that's too snobby. <laughs> um, no, sorry. I've been accused of being culturally sort of a Tory and politically kind of uh, you know I'm progressive, I think, but uh, culturally, I mean, I, I like my Bach, my Beethoven, and oh, so you're not interested in the avant-garde or not? No, oh, more more of a not interested. I, I think a lot of it really is crap. Right, so yeah, cause aesthetically and, and, you disagree with and, and, his and, and, view. And in fact, in my book, Literary L.A., I have a whole chapter on Thomas Mann and Schoenberg. Um, that's a long story mm -hmm. I, I, I won't go into, but uh, because my mom used to concertize with Michael Mann, who was Thomas's son, and, and so the Mons, when I grew up, we knew the Mann family really well, and I, you know, I knew quite a bit about the genesis of Dr. Faustus, and of course, Dr. Faustus essentially is a book which says that Arnold Schoenberg represented the decline of German civilization. That's what mm -hmm. Liverkuhn was. Yeah. And, and so I've often written on the subject of Schoenberg, uh, and Ronald Schoenberg, his son, who's a municipal judge of Beverly Hills, has got me fired from the LA Times, and he's really chased me around because, I, you know. But I was only reacting, talking about Schoenberg, to the fact that he was essentially the word Putmeister really kind of applies. And <laughs> when I was a kid in my mom's home, you know, people like, um, you know, the French composer, um, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people were around our house because my mom, my mother was a pianist, and there was, you know, was a lot of people, and they all had an incredible. They they all felt that Schoenberg was a fraud yeah. in the film, um, and I guess I never really kind of dropped that attitude. It's so a, here you see someone who's totally influenced in a way by that. <laughs> well, in fairness to him, I I think actually Frank had some good musical taste. He didn't think much of Schoenberg, and you right. can almost always tell when somebody likes Schoenberg. They're usually pseudo intellectual. <laughs> Yeah, so you would say he's not a Schoenbergian, but he was still within the avant-garde camp. Which well, Frank, you know, Lionel and Frank had something they had strange, some strange things in common, despite both of them, perhaps. Um, Frank was as avant-garde as he was. He was still kind of conservative, I think, culturally, yeah. in the sense that, especially the composers that he liked, were all 19th century figures. This is the beefer dialectic. There you go. You yeah. know, Frank, who controlled and not controlled. Yeah, right. And Frank really liked composers who pushed tonality as far as you could push it, but never abandoned it entirely. Right. Therefore, uh, for him, he'd much rather have listened to Weber or Bear than to Schoenberg, because there is at least a suggestion of a skeletal kind of, uh, it's not exactly a melodic structure, but you can see the bones of it a was like, bar like Bartok has or done Bartok very, very 20th century with melody. Mm -hmm. yeah. it is, it's highly melodic, but it's, it's not composition. Yeah, it's not composition by slide rule. It's yeah. composition by, by yeah, breaking know, I also, down. I also grew up with a, a, you know, a prejudice towards Spartak because Spartak wrote a, you know, his great violin concerto he wrote for my uncle, for Yehudi, and Yehudi actually subsidized and supported him in the last days of his life and so on. So I knew a lot about yeah, the Bartok, what you call it, but I, I just, to me, when I think of really great composers in the 20th century, and we produce actually some pretty good ones, you know, like Bartok and Prokofiev, and, uh, you know, maybe even Copeland in this kind of second-rate sort of way. Um, you, you know, uh, then you're really talking about greatness, and, and and I think Zappa had talent, and some of the later stuff actually was pretty good, you know. I wasn't that impressed at the time with it, but you know there could have been certain sexual jealousy I felt. And but now, if you heard more of his work and looked at you it, you know some of the later yeah. stuff I've heard. Actually, I, I realized he had more talent than I was willing to admit. What I think I did feel about the Beefheart thing, and it wasn't so much Beefheart's music that I liked; it was his lyrics. Yeah. And and uh, and so when we spent that, we went out around nine o'clock, I think, in the evening. And no, we didn't. Eddie's we went out at about like midnight. Midnight, and we yeah. it, the sun came up, and we were. Still going at it, and I really like the way Beefheart's mind worked, you know. But the, yeah, there again, true. that was music that was not right. You, know. you, you went till did you say till the sun came up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they finally they kind it. of they made us kind of leave. I mean, <laughs> we had to be giving her one cup of coffee, you know. Yeah, but Don had a cup of tea. But I just liked the way his mind worked, and I was just, who's uh, Frank? Don, yeah. Don's. No, 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 Don. Don's. You disliked the way Don's mind? No, no, I did. I liked oh, the way like, his mind worked, yeah. and I was just more impressed by him than. You know, in terms of the music and the way I sort of reacted to the sort of Hitlerian way that uh, I thought Zappa ran his, mm -hmm. you know, in fairness, he wasn't working with the same caliber of musicians that you would work with, uh, even George Duke and so on. I mean, they're good, but, you know, I suppose a lot of 
really good classical musicians playing with each other are going to generally be of a higher level. Well, yeah. what happened towards the end of his life, Frank did work more with those kind of musicians. Yeah, the ensemble modern. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Finally found somebody who do it. He found people that understood what he wanted them to do. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you you say that Frank liked Lionel more than Lionel liked Frank. Yeah. Did they have? Did you guys have aesthetic conversations? Yeah. Cultural discussions. Yeah. 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 I remember one. It consisted of Lionel saying to Frank after especially noisy rehearsal he looks to Frank sitting in his chair about like where Jerry is now and Lionel standing looking down at him and he says what would you do meaning all this electrical you know instru electric instruments says, what would you do if you had a power failure and he figured that would floor Frank totally Frank looked up to him and said you'd get a generator <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like I mean to me instruments have been around for you know a couple of millenniums developing like the violin and uh, you know there's I like acoustic instruments and, and I, I'm a guy who when Bob Dylan picked up the uh, electric guitar he you thought know, it was all electric over. Electric was over for yeah. me. Although I've studied guitar, you know classical guitar so I felt a little... Do you have many contacts on the East Coast? Uh, do you know Bob Fast and the WBAI people? No. Oh. no I'm real Californian. <laughs> you stayed here most of your life? Oh, almost all my life. I just I went to London for I did. I went to London for about a year. And yeah. Why did you go? How did you end up in London? Like, what was to do the album, and that was the place to go? You came with I me. had. Yeah, Lionel was there, and but that's uh, I was working on. The, I was working on. I was yeah. working on the menu, and so I'd gotten it in advance from Putnam to go do a yeah. book. Oh, I see. You. So actually, your relationship started in seventy three. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. It was kind of spotty, but yeah, yeah, it was a period it was on. And so that's why you're over there. Yeah, yeah. and I I wanted to pedal my demo that yeah. Frank had produced and over there it seemed like a good opportunity because there wasn't anybody stateside who could appreciate it uh, and I, you know I found out it was an interesting experience for me because for six months I had an agent there at William Morris peddling it for me and got some nibbles and stuff but you know nothing came of it so it was did you meet yeah. Pamela's Rubica over there no did you ever meet Pamela's Rubica you just know? once yeah where was that in uh, she came to a rehearsal believe it or not in LA about 74, I guess it would have been. In the, yeah, in the yeah. after Grand yeah. Zoo. Yeah. Um, and now she's someone who has a grievance against Frank. Uh, you I'm know sure I mean? she does, yeah. You know, she's another one bur felt burnt. Yeah. Well, because if you, anybody going back that far with Frank at the beginning knew a different person than he later became. Yeah. Did you read the, the book, Michael Gray? Yeah, Bates I did. Nature? I just read that recently. Yeah. What did you think of that? I think that's not a bad book. For I mean, showing, because showing it, that. It shows the transformation. Yeah, it shows what he was and what sort of. In a sense, I think what, if I can paraphrase, you know, an entire book simply, it seems like what sort of being sort of on the hot seat and having to put a public persona together, which is, in a certain sense, was alien to Frank. Yeah. I really felt that. Um, knowing him, what he ended up being as a result was kind of a grotesque figure. Mm -hmm. That's what Gray seems to be saying in that book. And, you know, it only got worse than the accident. He agrees with me, which is, I felt that a bit gratifying because people seem to think I was nuts for saying, I think poor Frank just got really knocked in the head and things happened to him afterwards, you know, but uh, Gray says the same thing. And essentially his personality changed drastically. After, after 71. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, um, I forget what the drift was. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, just a side issue, did you ever interact with Bukowski? Yes. <laughs> if you read Literary LA, I have a whole chapter about and I went out and we got drunk with him and went to various bars. Spent a night drinking with the guy, yeah. Yeah, you know. have a whole, in the book that I gave you. Was that 76, 77? When was that? About 80. 80. Because um, I, you, there was a Rolling Stone article on Bukowski in 1976 in May, June. No, I didn't write it. I, no, I, but I, I read it. I, I was in New York and I came, <laughs> I came out here and that article helped me find out where he lived or maybe uh -huh. the address or something. So I called him. So I went and visited him. And then when I went back to Toronto in 77, 78, I, um, I would call him up, but I didn't have a tape recorder. And it, it was unbelievable how he would talk to me over the phone. I mean, he just go total <laughs> pervert. And he just say, well, I won't go into it. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't you think I can go into it, Jerry? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get the, I get the giraffe. Anyways, yeah. so I spent six months talking to him like once a month, and mm -hmm. he would really, he, maybe the phone did it to him. He would just do an instant an autobiographical replay of what who I he was with last doing, night yeah. Yeah, and what he did. And so I got it for six months. So, That's great. Yeah, so that, that <laughs> so was... You made tapes of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, I wish I had taped. Yeah. That would have been priceless. Um, yeah, I had a thought there. Um, we're talking about... So that's The Messenger in 85. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, I guess I would go... I'm going another level now. When you were involved with Frank, uh, you know, as a young woman, mm -hmm. what did it not... 
is it was it because of the mood of the time the sexual license mm -hmm. was there any thought of his wife did, were you too young to think because since you've been hijacked by an alien <laughs> you <laughs> right, know. who cares about that sort of stuff right yeah um, what, what, did you ever think about that or was there a moral quandary about doing that or it didn't matter well i took my cues from frank um, I watched closely how he conducted his private life. Is that part of the tension you're referring to? Yeah. You mean? Now that's it's not said, but that's yeah. what you're realizing. Yeah. There's a bit of morality here that's going to be violated sure. at a certain level. And yet, it didn't seem morality is something. You know, I, I had come to this conclusion early in my life, which is that if society foisted on you, that's not morality. That's something else. It's when the two people involved in the relationship have a disagreement that it becomes immoral to hurt another person. Right. And I just didn't see anything that would indicate, I mean, it wasn't obviously like where it kind of began to dawn on me that there was, you know, maybe sort of a funny situation was when I was staying there and uh, I was down in the basement and I heard an argument upstairs, obviously Frank and his wife having it out over the fact that I was there. Yeah, you didn't yeah. say it was the sound, the voice of Gail in mm -hmm. the book, but yeah. it was definitely the voice of Gail? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I mean, I, I... And you didn't hear what they argued? I got the drift of it. I could understand a few words here and there. And was it, was, it about you? Yeah. Yeah, you don't say that in the book, but yeah, it's implied, I it's, guess. Yeah. Why wouldn't you say? Because um, you weren't sure? No, it's like I wasn't sure. It was because the way it came to me as an impression was it was about me, and yet it wasn't about me. Right. It was the ongoing argument in their relationship. It was not a new one. You did not know that at that instant. I just sensed it. You sensed it was an ongoing argument. Yeah, so in other words... That's the you heard what they deal what it's like they do. like two people that have played a duet, like you were describing between Don and Frank. Yeah, you know, both parties knew their roles real well. And but a new challenges came up to it. Yeah, they would yeah. just they would jam on different changes, shall we say? Yeah, and that's what that was. So, um, and then I began to realize, well, this is a neurotic scene I have wandered into, and I hated to think not of erotic, neur new erotic, new erotic, new or new erotic. New erotic. It could be the different yeah. levels there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I, I started to think, you know, that that was a little disappointing. I mean, I've had a lot of conflicting feelings about it. I mean, first thing I thought was, like, geez, I didn't think Frank was neurotic or in yeah. a neurotic situation, but he evidently was with that, and I didn't want to be part of it. And it just made me feel kind of creepy. Um, it wasn't so much, well, gee, am I you know, hurting somebody else, because the somebody else obviously may not have liked it, but in, in another sense, obviously she had been putting up with it for a long time, because I later heard stories that made me look like nothing. You right. Know? Uh, there was another. Uh, there were, well, on the uh, during that tour in New York, there were like three, no less than three gals who Frank had had relationships with previously, who all showed up at the same time. He, the only one that he let hang around was this one redheaded filmmaker, <coughs> one person, who was Miss Moviola. And, and did but, you know her real name? Karen something. I can't think of her last name. Did, did she do I'm well in the cinema underground? She cinema was a trustafarian. Well? She just was sort of like dabbling in film, I think. Just a what? A trustafarian. She had money from a wealthy family. <laughs> trustafarian. Eh? <laughs> trustafarian money. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what ever became of her, and I don't think she went on to, to do anything, because judging by kind of the, the picture that I got of her, she was, you know, a nice enough person, but not really anybody who had any real creative drive. She's, Frank was using her because she had good connections with the, you know, he's bringing out the movie, yeah. she knew critics, she knew, you know, important people, and he was just sort of jollying her along. She was really pretty, too, but I mean, there was, it was, you know, that kind of a relationship. So I could see that, but it... And then the other two gals were, were women he'd known in the village when he was there in 66, and they right. had ongoing relationships with him off and on, too, and I began to realize, too, there's a lot of competition for this job. Um, and did that make you think, oh, I'm... Did you wonder, am I <coughs> subjectifying our love relationship, that there's a love aspect more than there really is? Like, that could... Be, was that a question? Um, I never thought there was a love relationship with us. But you felt himself. that you had a special relationship. I, you sort of oh, yeah. oh, felt definitely. that there was something special. Well, because, you see, when you say love, it's like both parties going in with their eyes closed and their fingers crossed, right? I don't think either of us had our eyes closed. I might have more than Frank. But there still was a lot of really good, warm stuff that came through, I think, that relationship for both of us. It wasn't what I would call a conventional love relationship at all. Right. I, I, I would say that you were unique because your music ability and yeah. your woman, we talked about that, Yeah. did... Do you think that made you still feel special, even though these other women were? That was exactly. Around? I told yeah. myself, well, it's like the way I describe in the book about, you know, about this gal, Ms. Moviola. I said, the truth is, she still can't jam on the blues with him all night the way I can. Right. So, so you had that edge. Sure. Yeah. And because yeah, through the years, I've I've met different people who knew uh, a woman mm -hmm. who had an affair with Frank oh, when yeah. he went to New York or someplace sure. in the seventies and eighties. It yeah. went on. Yeah. Matter of fact, the, the myth is that Gail built the studio, mm -hmm. covers the studio, to get to keep Frank him home. back, yeah. keep him home. Well, that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
you can wander. Now there was uh, when you walked back into the room the night with Miss Moviola. Mm -hmm. I, I don't oh yeah, know that wasn't. Oh yeah, that was actually the afternoon. It was not even afternoon. It was like early, you know, noonish time. Right, and the lights were low. The right? lights were yeah. It went open. And I okay. can't remember. I went you, to get you my You apply wallet. a great image. Fill us in what you saw. You, like his writhing. The, writhing the beast was, with two backs. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Zircon's evil creation, you know, because yeah. we're talking about the sock and all the experimental stuff. Was he doing that with her? That Not really. Of? It was just sex, but it, it just had this feeling about it of like, you know, because obviously I was in a hyper state of hyper awareness yeah. at that point, and it was like, a, it was a shock and a, a real transformation because I had never up until. You saw the dog. Yeah, you the, saw the, the dog, dog was humping. The yeah. dog was, <laughs> yeah. looked like totally animalistic. Yeah, 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 exactly. Whatever. And, and I, never, I, I mean, I, I had that sense of Frank before, but I had never seen him actually having sex with another person, so I walked right. in and there it was, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know, Gail in Rock Wives, have you read Gail? Yeah. yeah, yeah. She says she has run, walked oh, yeah. in in places yeah. where she saw Frank with another woman yeah. and didn't like it, but she put up what with it. What can you do? You know? Yeah, so I, I always wondered if you were one of them, but... Looks, well, like she that never argument, she never... No, for some reason, she never came down to the basement when I stayed there. She never came down there, and... It was a two-level, two-world was, house, wasn't oh, it? Oh, boy, was it ever, yeah. yeah. You know, it was like... Well, that, that, that Dr. Zircon sign was right over the entrance as, you, as you came in. Yeah, and it was... Uh, a, I came in from the street or from the kitchen up like above? Like, if you came from, from upstairs, like the... the it's on the door above. Right, 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 yeah. And you go down and into the dungeon. And you go down into the dungeon, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. pretty symbolic. But how did you ever see that sign if you would never... Oh, I, went in, I went into the, the house a few times. Like, I went into when the kitchen. When she wasn't around. Yeah, she wasn't... I didn't see her. She wasn't there, you know, the whole time. I mean, I guess she went out and did things. Yeah, I was at the house... In you said like in 70 or March 70, 70 the yeah. first week, and later right. in the week, Friday night, Saturday. Did you go back after the remodel? Because yeah, here's, I was yeah. going to do this. Yeah. In March in March 70, mm -hmm. did you see the Hot Rats uh, concert? No, you would be, the Hot Rats you, you were still young, you were in school. Which Hot Rats concert? Because I saw it. March 70 at the Olympic. Oh, absolutely. Olympic. That was terrific, yes, yeah. I love that. With uh, Shuggy Otis. Was there was, it? yeah, uh, Ian and uh, Sugar Cane Harris. Yeah, Sugar Cane yeah, Harris. And Max Bennett and I forgot, Ainsley on drums. Yeah, and a matter of fact, Frank did a whole number, which I'm sure you remember. It's a real Dada situation, this thing, of collecting clothes from the audience. Right. And hanging them up on the mic stand. Right. The red pants flung to me. Really? You you yeah. were in the front? You yeah. got a good seat? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, what, what, you, but, um, maybe you could answer this. He came yeah. out, mm -hmm. and when the show started, the first thing he said, the monster in the sky. And the, and what, I always thought he was commenting in pop radio, mm -hmm. and spirit in the sky was big right, right at that point. Right. Was Do you know why, is that what he was referring to? When he goes, monster in the sky? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't remember I that. I mean, it's his conceptual continuity, monster yeah, magnet. Yeah, something. But maybe. he could fit it into... Maybe like, well, maybe he was thinking of something like if you're sitting in a movie theater watching a, a cheesy sci-fi movie and the opening, you know, the credits roll, the first thing you see is the, the monster on the, the horrible nylon string. All right, he's probably, okay. And he means it, maybe he's, I'm the monster, I'm back. Yeah, I'm the monster yeah, in the sky. Yeah, it could, yeah, because it's like, you know, in a drive-in. It's a lot like a drive-in. That was a stand-up kind of a festival seating, quote-unquote. Yeah. Everybody's like crowded towards the front of the... Probably looked just like a drive-in theater to him. Right. Yeah, maybe like that's what he... It was yeah. a personal thing. But I thought it was just his comment on the latest hit song, you know, yeah. in the... Well, it could be that, the, too. But yeah. The, the, all yeah, purpose, you know. Yeah, that's where he's really smart. He can uh, say mm -hmm. something, th th or he can th get an impression. To, oh, this relates collectively. I'll say it. Right. You know what Throw I mean? it in there. Oh, yeah. he did that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Now the um, in that concert, I went down after. Uh, I'd met him a few days before. Mm -hmm. That's when the conceptual continuity thing. I told him, Frank, it's time to release the conceptual continuity idea. We're <laughs> on to it. You know, <laughs> time to screw with it, muddle yeah. it up. You right. know, play with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he, I went down behind the stage and. All of these people were hanging around, ready to try to talk to him. There were kids saying, "Frank, take my record, take my record." You yeah, know, all yeah, this stuff. Yeah. But what struck me is he just went down. He was nice. He what he did it was one. There was a woman, probably a friend from years ago, mm -hmm. a beatnik woman, mm -hmm. and he he went over like you you crawl along like a Groucho Marx kind of walk. <laughs> I'll just do it here. Yeah. He went. Like this tour, like she was over there. And then she's got a new friend. Like she's already, she knew the dog. She goes, "Hi, Frank," and she was older, mm -hmm. old friend. And he sees her and he goes like this, ah! like that. He goes, <laughs> and she's there like giggling. But he just did it jokingly. Yeah, yeah. And so then he got up. He got up, and he, he talked to a few kids. And he said, "Call my office. Call my office." Mm -hmm. And he had to get out of there. And he walked down, and he was walking. I watched his, his um, walk, and he looked. He had the tight asshole 
uh, <laughs> a gay fag person at that point. Yeah, I know, you know what you mean. mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. And it's I said, Jesus, Frank's a, is a homosexual. Must be gay. You know, I mean, I don't want to. I know exactly what you mean because like, you've yeah. seen that oh, walk. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know exactly. It was like yeah. totally. It was strange because he was sort of masking to me. Oh yeah. You know, there he, was nothing really swishy about it. Yeah, it wasn't swishy. He just had a yeah, very yeah. tight bun. I know what you mean. And it waddled, yeah. and he had a yeah. nerd. I know. And Monty Python ridiculous walk. He really did. His whole body. I just was fascinated by his body mo motions because the way he was built. Yeah. Was so strange. That's right. He was a collage of different. It's uh, really body parts that didn't fit. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you would say that he wasn't. I mean, is that a gay stereotype? That what? I know tight exactly. Asshole thing? I know what you mean from from the back. He yeah. Had sort of his butt had a certain look so to it. Yeah. It was up. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. He yeah. was like you know, a primping idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had a certain arrogance in his carriage. That's yeah. right. And yeah. he was he just walked all real yeah. fast, and he had this great way of being. Yeah. His head was above everything. Yeah. Mm. His chin. He led with his chin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He you led know? with his chin. Yeah. And he just yeah. disappeared. Yeah. But yeah. I never got over that image. But I realized when I looked at him later, mm -hmm. the, the body parts. I said, Yeah, he was a weird body. Yeah. You know? And then yeah, he really did. So of course, after the accident, it got a lot worse because one leg was a lot shorter than the other. Actually, what yeah, what I saw did not exist. I assume no. later. But he was always like really kind of klutzy, even yeah. before he was. But injured. he was he walked so graceful. Oh yeah, in a way. yeah. It was attitude though. He was a donkey. Was, yeah. He's the logos. Yeah. You know, this awkward yeah. donkey that. There was uh, a horsey quality to him, but yeah. it wasn't quite a horse. It was like a zebra. Giraffe. A giraffe. Oh, this is a cybernetic gazelle. Yeah. And <laughs> so those right. those animal yeah. terms, I always thought he yeah. knew he looked like that. Yeah. He was yeah. like pigs and repugnant and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So you saw that. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, so you would agree that he didn't walk like that after his accident. Mm -mm. He, no, in fact, when he walked, it was kind of painful, and he walked with a limp. The last time I saw Frank physically, with my own eyes, in person, was at the Santa Monica Civic concert, which I can't remember if it was like December of 80 or January of 81. But Is that the Solonemski? The Solonemski concert. Yeah. And I saw him walk across the stage when he came out at first. And my heart just like started to, it hurt almost to watch him because he was walking painfully. Yeah. It just, you know, almost was like I remembered when he first got up out of the wheelchair and tried to walk. It was almost the same, just a little faster. Right. Yeah, yeah I only yeah. saw him, whenever I saw yeah. him in the years after mm -hmm. that, he was always in sitting down and that. So mm -hmm. I never saw much of that other than walking stage, but he sort of walked on slow. Yeah. 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 yeah he was, yeah. He's, I had a guy at a, uh, did a thing at LA, the bookstore here in Santa Monica um, last weekend. and. Uh, in fact, uh, it was it was pretty funny. Uh, the guy was talking about watching Frank conduct. He actually saw him. I don't know whether it was live or in a, a film or whatever, but he said it was the most angular, funny-looking conductor. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. No grace and no corners, angles only. And yeah. that's that was Frank, black or white, you up mean, or down, you're fast saying, or slow. You know. No, I'm not sure. That was Frank. In what sense? Well, it, the, the description of Frank's angular conducting style, like that. This guy just down, noticed. This guy had you seen it. And was describing it. it and. He, he hit it right on the head, inadvertently or otherwise, because that was the way Frank did things, was very in a very angular fashion. Like, right. his guitar playing, as florid as it is, it is kind of on an axis, it's up, it's down. It's, yeah, he was like taking yeah. perpendicular angles. Yeah. Yeah. He was like a control person trying to be chaotic. Yeah, and yeah. And doing fractals or something. <laughs> right. or whatever. Right. I, I don't know he was fractal. fascinated by fractals, actually. Yeah. yeah. What, what, um, okay, there was another thing. Mm -hmm. When you had your last, uh, you know, in mm -hmm. personal interaction, yeah. Yeah. you say, uh, I read this to Jerry, uh, and uh, I didn't know it was not obvious, but uh, I think he went first, at least I hope so. Mm -hmm. I said, Jerry, that means he comes, he came first. <laughs> Jerry says, does? Is that what <laughs> no, you mean? No, not there, not there. What, it, what, what I do you mean? I was, I was talking, actually, I wrote that with a real feeling of despair. Um, in other words, it was a situation in the bathroom at the rehearsal hall yeah you're in the bathroom no you we haven't got to the yeah you walked to the bathroom and locked the door yeah well I in other words you went first oh yeah well you can look at it that way and then it's funny but but no, you don't mean it that way no no no. i think he went to the bathroom first and, and went in as opposed to in other words he was the instigator not me if i was the instigator I, you know you know what no, I'm saying? oh that's what you're saying it, it, was, it doesn't make you see yeah. walk to the back walk to the bathroom and lock the door that means you're inside it already right yeah i know you could you could look at it that way i suppose so I thought. So I thought he came first. It was like, he well, he 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 loved me more. He went. He couldn't hold it longer. Right, right, right. It, it was a real, very no, intimate it, section. What it meant is I was like feeling real shame when I wrote that. I mean, because I 
My oh, I used to go. Yeah, so you're saying I think my, he, he started it. He started it. Yeah, I, at least I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> God will decide yeah, that, right? He'll, he'll well, that was it. The cosmic, it was like the final kind of declaration. Right. You couldn't get any worse. Kind of thing. So, no, it's like, you know, when you die, you go to God, they'll play the videotape. Right. Said, mm, uh, five, four, Frank went first. You get out, Frank right. goes to hell. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Frank would have appreciated that. Yeah. So the. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but you, I just remembered, you were going to say something about Matt Graney, no, Matt there Graney, was a yeah. story in there. Mm -hmm. Matt, when we started to, Lionel and I started working for the LA Reader virtually when it began, because James Vowell, who was the original editor, uh, he's now the publisher of it in, in, you know, kind of a continuing thing, but um, he had worked at the LA Times, and Lionel had met him there as when he was on the copy desk with the opinion page. Anyway, uh, this was 78, 79? This was or 80? 70, 78, I guess. I wrote my first article for him in 79. Lionel got in a little earlier, I think. Um, and the, is Matt there right then? Matt started out right at the beginning, as far as I remember. He was like general factotum, Mr. Pencil Sharpener, Schlepper. Right. This is the, the life in hell. This yeah, was it hell. was. It yeah. was. I mean, it was yeah. horrible. And, you know, James, the, the guy who was editing it, um, was not... He was really sharp, but he was really nitpicky. He didn't see right away. Matt had all kinds of, um, you know, pretty neat cartoons. They were pretty darn funny. But you couldn't get them published anywhere because they were drawn kind of in a very simplistic style. And people yeah. said, eh, you don't know how to draw. So it, we uh, did a, in 1980, we did an event. Matt was still sh schlepping for the reader. We did a, uh, an event at a coffee house in Silver Lake called The Onyx, which was about to kind of go out of business. And it needed a real shot in the arm to keep hang on to it. So it was like a rent party almost. But we organized this thing called a literary circus where we had for... 12 hours. We had people coming in and reading poetry, doing musical performances, we had art displays and all kinds of neat stuff. And it got a lot of publicity for the coffee house and that was a good thing. So one of the things, Matt kind of heard we were putting this on and he kind of came to us with hat in hand. I, I just cherish this memory, this hilarious. And begged us for a little bit of wall space so we could put up some of his panels, his comics, right? So um, we said, sure, Matt, why not? We were, we were really so magnanimous. We should have gotten a medal. You know? <laughs> and this is 1980? 1980. Because mm -hmm. I, I saw him in, in April 80. So mm -hmm. when is this? When was the Fall or summer? Yeah, it was, in the, it was August, September. Yeah, so I mean, <clears> okay. Pretty hot, that's for yeah. sure. It was like 100, almost 100 degrees that day. Anyway, so Matt's stuff went up, and I think he actually sold a couple of things. And I guess, you know, his career kind of gradually started creeping forward, but before it really did, uh, there was a funny thing that happened. Uh, Matt and another guy who worked at the reader called Richard Gare, who was, they were a couple of art students, basically. G-E-H-R? G-E-H-R. Doesn't he write for The Voice? No, he does. Yeah, The Voice, yeah. yeah. He, he left and went to New York, actually not too long after this, really. Um, but he and Matt were really good friends, and they... Um, um, would talk about music all the time and they were always like kind of I wrote some music stuff for the reader I didn't do much music but when I did I you know I wrote the beef heart piece for example right. and uh, other stuff I never wrote about Frank too much just a little in passing you know um, but it was really interesting because they would ask me questions about off the wall and avant-garde kinds of music that you know if they had Ooh, questions Richard and Matt Richard would. and Matt would yeah you had it, a seniority I mean they seem to think so which I thought was kind of amusing <laughs> Um, he, and he, Matt, did not know you were with Frank. Right. He, and then, you had to keep that from him. He would have freaked, right? Well, I think, I don't know how he would have taken no, it. No, he would have wanted to know. Well, no, here, let me tell you the story, okay? Okay. He uh, was very down on Frank. Yeah. He we was, have a 1981 article in the reader he wrote putting, calling Frank a misogynist. The following or week, I, I had a talk with him that I wrote a letter to the editor. After what? The next week, after that article, okay. a review of the Santa Monica Civic Ran, and I... I, I took Matt to task. I said, you know, if you don't like something about a specific, you know, about a concert specifically, then tell tell what you don't like. But to take just like vicious pot shots at somebody that you know you don't know what the situation is is not. It's just not a decent thing to do. And Matt kind of he Did admitted, they it? yeah, yeah. Around. If you looked at the follow, I've got it. I can send you a copy of it. Uh, anyway, I talked to Matt. And the next time I went to the office, the article, you know, the letter ran, and I said, Matt, what is it about Frank that bothers you so much? Because you're not being fair. If you don't like his music, that's fine. You can say yeah, that. It's, yeah. not, it's free country. But the way he did it was really mean spirited because it was. It's yeah. just like, Ugh, you know, stick the knife in, go ahead. You know, and everything. What, because what you've been talking about of people that burn were burned by Frank. I think Matt felt that without ever having met him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he felt abandoned. Yeah. I, I'll tell yeah, you. I can yeah. supplement what happened in '77. I know yeah. why. Uh, uh, yeah. But go on. Okay. Oh, so, so how did he respond to Matt that? Matt said, you know, first he, you know, and then he started thinking about it. And to his credit, he said, you know, you might be right. 
And then he says, you know, I'd really... Within like the same conversation. Oh, uh, actually, it was took place over a week or two. Right, an and I saw him again, and, and I saw him again. And, 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 and finally he said, do you have Frank's phone number? And I said, yeah. Would you give it to me so I can call him? I think I owe him an apology. Ooh. I did. He called up, and then they became friends. Is that <laughs> and the rest is history, yeah. He would never have, I mean, at that point in his life, gotten... He, I think, and it took Frank a while to kind of become friendly with Matt, because well, Matt... Matt says like, he never really started visiting Frank until 89, later. 90. Right, right. But he had made a little contact. But he contact. made an initial contact, yeah. and he tried it. And Frank, you know, I think probably at that point was touring a lot, too, so he probably yeah. wouldn't have been too encouraging about it. Buddy, buddy, type but you shit. gave. I mean, Frank so wouldn't like have, you giving out numbers. Well, I thought. But this, this was this, a, was, this was relevant. This was appropriate yeah. because he owed him an apology, and that was the only way he was going to be able to give it to him. He could write him a letter, but it's not the same thing. And I thought it was restitution. And yeah. it, you know, I wouldn't. But have done he that. actually did apologize. He called him up and apologized. Well, oh, that's friend. amazing, and it was yeah. because of you, yeah. <laughs> who was alienated from Frank, but right. aesthetically that's, knew the standards. Right. And, and right. I thought the whole thing was pretty ironic. But anyway, yeah. so you're going to say what happened in '77? When when I met him, see, I met him through Urban Gorder. Ah. Uh -huh. um, Urban told me. It's a small world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was in touch, or I can't remember exactly. I know that Urban told me about Matt or Matt told me about Urban mm -hmm. and it was a crisscross so so when I came here in 77 um, I called Matt and mm -hmm. he was working he had just come to LA in right August from Seattle yeah Seattle, August yeah. Seven, he'd been at the Evergreen College mm -hmm. right and um, <laughs> he he was working this is August and now it's October he's got the job the Xerox thing and he's driving the chauffeur around, or he's mm -hmm. chauffeuring a guy that he's writing his biography for, some old Hollywood guy. You know that God, story? Yeah, no, yeah. That's, that, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. he answered that. I mm -hmm. want someone to write my story. And the guy would just drive around every night and say, well, we did this there, we did that. Yeah. And Matt was supposed to note take this notes and write, take notes. God. And I don't, it didn't lead anywhere, I don't think. Yeah. So I meet him in 70, in two months later, and mm -hmm. he's. He hates doing that zero. He's a college graduate. Mm -hmm, right. I think he was a student president kind of guy. Yeah, you know, yeah. He was active in the yeah. university. So here, it's part of the depression, I guess. He, he's now got <laughs> a degree. He's nothing. He's Xerox. Yeah. But it was great because he Xeroxed all the hot rats times for him. Yeah, yeah. So we got together a couple times, and he's the one who got me, told me how to find Don. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember his friend Phil went off with the residents of San Francisco? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What uh, happened to that, Phil? Phil uh, was his name Davis or Davidson? Phil's, yeah, it was something like that. He came to, no, boy, this is a strange one. He came to Bill Griffith. Bill Griffith knew all the residents, right. all of those guys. and they. Now, he, you wouldn't know Phil and Matt until 79, 80. Right, right, right. So this is later. Right, but this guy Phil uh, in 1980. Long black hair. Yeah, yeah, in 1984 he came to a book signing Bill Griffith, and I did it at Cody's in Berkeley, along with some of the other guys from the residents. Yeah, and, and so Phil knew Bill through the knew, old residence. Right, so right. It, was, it is a small world. Yeah, because, and I was asking Don, Friday mm -hmm. night, Don Preston, uh -huh. do you remember, see, when I, in 77, Matt turned me on to a guy who, um, uh, a bootlegging network, mm -hmm. and I went to him, mm -hmm. and we went to another place, and the guy made the Cucamonga era single. Oh, great. He, he took all the, the uh -huh. ten signals, singles, uh -huh. right. and they they made, a, they made a record, you know, oh, yeah. grind it up yeah, in a right. simple yeah. vinyl manufacturing. Yeah, so Matt gave me that. Mm -hmm. Then he told me to go visit Phil, who was involved with Beef Art. Mm -hmm. So I go over to Phil's, and when we arrive, Phil answers the phone, or there's a message, and he calls him, and then when he gets off, mm -hmm. uh, he said, guess who that was? I said, no, he says, that was Don Preston. Mm -hmm. I mean, guess who that is? I don't know. <laughs> Don Preston. And he might come over. I said, oh, gee, that'll be great. Meet Don. Uh -huh. So what? then Phil played me the tape of uh, The Fire in yeah. Montreux. Uh -huh. They had that yeah. on the bootleg network. Yeah. And so then uh, oh boy, that then was... Matt told me, so then Phil said, I'll give you the number of a guy at a Kentucky Fried Chicken or something in in in, in uh, Lancaster. Um who, a younger guy, who mm -hmm. Don was educating about his uh, black music roots. <laughs> and so I called that guy, and he told me where the, what the name of the mobile place was. Mm -hmm. So then I drove out later, and that's how I connected with Don, and mm -hmm. I set up a very really good interview with him in Toronto. Uh -huh. But while I was there, September, in October, November, we went to a Zappa concert at the Poly on the UCLA, mm -hmm. the Poly Pavilion. Right, right. And uh, I think it was Linda Berry was living with him as a friend there. Mm -hmm. There was a, a woman there we knew from college and I and I heard later mm -hmm. that Linda lived with them or they were friends yeah. or something and I think they were really good friends in fact she um, did she have black hair uh, I think she's a redhead yeah, so see, I'm not sure if it was her. Yeah, but because, there were, yeah, she ordered a copy of Alfred Jarry, the hardcover, which was expensive, the signed limited edition from from my publisher when it came. Anyway. Yeah, she heard about that through Matt, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So 
Did they finish? So yeah. the thing about Phil, that he he was uh, he one of these early computerized music. He was trying to be yeah. a musician. Yeah. With this, what do you call those machines? Like MIDI equipment. Yeah, yeah, MIDI. It was like before the chip, yeah, I guess. Yeah, pre, pre MIDI. Yeah. Yeah. Pre chip. Am I right saying it's pre chip? Well, yeah. Or it's, or it's the pre, chip is part of it. Well, yeah, because MIDI is you run it through a, a regular computer. It's, yeah. It's not self-contained, but yeah. So it is a chip factor, but it's really primitive, right? Yeah. It's yeah. It, it's chip. You can say memory. Is yeah. So he had all these wires, and he was doing that. Mm -hmm. But he said, "I'm going to go to San Francisco and hang out with the residents." <laughs> yeah. So that's how he met Bill Griffith. I see. I guess. Yeah. yeah. So we go to the concert, and then we come back, and Matt, the two women. One I thought in retrospect mm -hmm. was Linda Berry mm -hmm. and and Matt were mad at Frank. These, yeah. This was the uh, you know the the, the <laughs> lather period. Yeah. Um, I have I don't know it wasn't Bobby Brown, but uh, some miss they they were telling me well well he felt defensive and he says you know my friend Linda whatever is um, they. Frank's a misogynist, you know. He's a he's a male chauvinist. Yeah, that was one of Matt's points in his review too. Right, yeah. he's a male chauvinist, and uh, and uh, you know you see that he's a guy from the fifties. He doesn't know what's happening, and and I always remember looking at him and looking at the girls, and they're younger than me, and I'm mm -hmm. saying, hmm, there's that political correctness of the mm -hmm. women's lib coming up, and the guys have to go along with the yeah, women, exactly. you know, to have a relationship. I could see that in yeah. them, whoever it was. Yeah, and I said that's ah, a good point. Yeah, because yeah, sure. It was yeah. Matt probably was being influenced unduly yeah. by his, you know. Go I mean, Matt's the women are right, but yeah. but you know, there's all. They're the right, but there's more levels to it. Yeah. yeah, and so I knew that that was a, an Im immature thing, and I said, we need Frank to remind us of the other right. thing. You know That's what I mean? Right. Yeah. The dog energy. The male principle needs yeah. to be preserved, not <laughs> obliterated. Yeah. But yeah, it has yeah. to be put in check, maybe. So yeah. they, I thought that was a wimpy '70s kid yeah. response. I said, "You guys, you don't dig it. You're not into the energy of Frank." Yeah. That was my. I didn't make a big issue. But yeah. That was my personal. Mm -hmm. So I always thought Matt failed on the Zappa test. You know what I mean? Because of yeah. going to the concert with him. Yeah. And then when I met him in 1980, he was in a very depressed state because he was delivering this stuff. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. It's just before mm -hmm. the before cartoon thing. Really big, yeah. And I said, "Gee, Matt, he really is a." He's lost, you know, and yeah. he, he, what he had bought me a uh, the ten the collectibles, mm -hmm. ten records. Oh yeah, the old masters. Yeah, he had yeah. saved them, not the old masters, the bootleg. Oh, the boots. Yeah. yeah. So he had one for me, so mm -hmm. we exchanged it or something, but he was really in a uh, a lost state, and uh, I thought I was thinking uh, I would I was a bit de detached from Frank then, in a sense I'd go in and out. Mm -hmm. I'd always track Frank, but I wouldn't uh, always like everything. Yeah. Generally, I like yeah. something every album. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that Matt was sort of stuck in the past, yeah. hassling, sort of damaged by Frank. I yeah, think. right. Because I knew about the damage effect very early via Wally. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Right. And the thing. Right. So I knew things about Frank that people didn't know. Sure. And so Matt still didn't. Put Matt was still believed in the myth and, and yeah. needed to. So that's the thing with people. If they buy the myth, which isn't true, of course, yeah. they get broken hearted over it. It's all these people on the net that are pissed off about my book because it talks about Frank as he was rather as, as they right. think he was. That's right. Yeah. And, and with, as generations mutate, who knows what these it's, little kids think Frank represents This them. reminds me a little bit of probably what happened with the Bible. Yeah. In the sense of the stories were stories. You know, yeah. They happened, all right, but the farther and farther away people got, the more garbled they became, you know? Especially when they get locked down on a manuscript form, Right, And right. then they become printed book. It's, yeah. And then, it, yeah. It so, goes and through, you don't argue with it after that because it's canonized. I have, a, I have a kind of a joking term I use. I call it Zappa orthodoxy, which is people who really have really ironclad ideas about who Frank was and right. what his art represents and they aren't going to deviate by calling And I learned that from yeah. Craig Pinkett when he said, yeah. well, I had met Frank, but it's, I, I wasn't at lawyer for him. Mm -hmm. And Craig said, when I met Frank, I realized I didn't know who, who I didn't, he was not the person I thought he was. Mm -hmm. He was totally a different person, you know, mm -hmm. than the image he had. So the, I was lucky to meet people. Yeah. So, and then I met Beefheart and those guys. But the thing, yeah. the thing about Matt is that when he was interviewed in that special Zappa issue, in 90 or something mm -hmm. he talked about how right, he right. wandered from Frank in the early 80s yeah. and I, we knew exactly you knew what he meant. Yeah. and you were part of it yeah. but I didn't know he apologized yeah. but then Frank did put out great stuff in the last 80s you know mm -hmm. which you were appreciating in retrospect Matt knew enough to appreciate the latest and then yeah. he came back to become right. Frank is my Elvis you know? yeah, right. but we know yeah. there wasn't in there in the middle well, Elvis left the building for a while yeah <laughs> <laughs> This has been Contemporary Communications Conference. My name is Jerry Fialka. We'd like to thank Nigel Lennon, the author of the book Being Frank, My Time with Frank Zappa, and Bob Dobbs, author of the book Fatic Communion with Bob Dobbs. Thanks a lot.
Well, you're welcome. Yeah. Sorry for the fuss and fun. Jerry, we're not finished. I'm not. <laughs> That's a good no, way to you end. You've got that on tape notes. Can we go look? We, I'm not going to end on math. <laughs> Wait, you, you got to ask her. Okay, can no, you, we, now I want to get into conceptual stuff. Okay. Can you handle that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I want to talk music ideas, mm -hmm. Frank's ideas. Are you do a, mm -hmm. Maybe it's good. I get time to look up the section. You give a very good description of Frank in general. But yeah, just edit. Oh, no, we can edit. edit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to end on talking about Matt. Yeah, well, that might no, cut. the thing you guys missed about Matt was that the, at that period, and we have your you, your Nige, your le, uh, article in the reader with Don has an illustration, right, and it's uh -huh. my day with Don at right, Denny's. Right, he's sitting at Denny's. We got that. Yeah. We got your letter that you wrote to read. Right. We got all that. It's okay, all good. okay yeah. now <laughs> we got we the, got all that. The all thing is, is that the, does. <laughs> right. The, the yeah. thing is, is that Matt was going to write a book on Frank. I heard about and that. And then when he wrote the article for the reader, Frank says, "No way." Yeah. And then <laughs> Matt was going, "Well, my second choice was a." dead so I might write a book on <laughs> and then he didn't have any relationship with Frank for, me, yeah. all, for, for, for all those years yeah. he just you know I was there when he ki they kissed backed up to the fucking you know cause Diva watched the Simpsons with Frank right. and it was the big ritual so right. then somehow Matt got Retouched, you know, but but yeah. or reconnected, but yeah. the the re thing that Frank that, re reinstated, reinstated right? But yeah. Frank was pissed that this guy wrote that, and he yeah. says, "No way, you're gonna write a book about me." Yeah, you know, he he. Well, well I'll tell you what's interesting though about that. Frank would get pissed because it is a valid criticism because we said, mm -hmm. and that's the interesting about you and him, the right. male female thing. Right. Is it and now, isn't it amazing that you were yeah. involved in that and you defended the, the other you side? Know, I thought of myself as the devil's uh, advocate. We're not going to end I'm the there. devil's advocate. <laughs> You thought of I it. I was the devil's yeah. advocate. But, but the, Literally. The, the thing yeah. Matt was pointing, it was true. Mm -hmm. Frank was a male chauvinist at a certain level. In a certain sense, sure. Yeah. He, was, and, he was an Italian guy from the 50s. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and so Frank yeah. would get upset about that little sure. review. Sure, it was. Yeah, he too. But the thing I objected to wasn't what Matt was saying. It was the yeah. way he said it and the fact that he basically was just taking horrible, uh, it was just insults, really. Yeah, it was and irrelevant. It was irrelevant because it had nothing to do with Frank. As That's right. a musician or as somebody putting his art out there in public, it had to do with Matt's conception of Frank that had been violated by something. Right. And Matt, you know, now if Matt had been really honest, he would. And have I'm said, telling you, what are you going to violate right. it by? I was there at that concert, right, exactly. Paul Pavilion. They were, my were, girlfriend were, thinks Frank Rab is an asshole. Yeah, and Frank would have appreciated that. Yeah, yeah, if he was yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If he was honest, He's yeah. bro Frank was so proud that he broke up so many marriages. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, Matt. He has written about in the L.A. Times <laughs> about uh, about five months ago that Matt's working with Gail on some oh, project. Oh yeah! And yeah. then the week yeah. after that, yeah. in the Reader, they print this review of Baby Snakes because my friend's mm -hmm. playing the videotape on uh, Melrose at a cafe. Oh really? Yeah. And got Gail's permission to play it, but the mm -hmm. Reader just yanks their old review, mm -hmm. which totally pans oh, Baby Snakes, and it says Matt Groening at the bottom. <laughs> I go, and, and Matt, and then I talk yeah, to Matt about it, and he calls up Gail. I didn't, I didn't write that, it. Gail. I didn't, I didn't write that. That's a mistake. And I was going, I, uh, I, 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 you, you probably sure. wrote it, he Matt. Sure, yeah. He was denied. That was the time he didn't like Frank was 79 that's or right 80, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I was there when I saw the, the, the concert that yeah. blew him out you know <laughs> there was a guy who it's really hilarious. took a, a rip rents oh, that's you know why I mean? wanted to ask you guys if you know because Rip has we, gone you know bananas, he's been with, yeah. with Frank for years praising him and then he he's uh, he's going right? Eddie Frank no, he's Rip been Rip. with Frank's camp for years, and then recently he got before Frank died. He got really close because Frank would call him up when some some musician was visiting, and and then he wrote the liner notes to Yellow Shark. Uh, Yellow yeah. Shark. Well, he started. I sent him a copy of a book because when he was well because Gene at, here. At the, when I was at the Herald. Yeah. Oh, that'd be a lot. Oh, he was yeah. the main Herald guy. And he oh, wrote, no, he wrote a nice piece movies. about me about yeah. literary LA when it first came out. In the Herald, and I just sort of thought I'd send Nigel's book because I've been the PR guy for Nigel's book. Right. And I sent it to Rip Brents, and I got back this really strange, snooty note. Well, but Gene thought you should do it. Too. Yeah, that friend of Gene mine. Gene yeah, from Rip that said. Well, uh, Nigel had committed some sort of horrendous sin by writing. I'm book. under Gail's wing now. I he, cannot approve of anything. That's what like he that. said. It was all, that's what, what it, it is. was. What it was was I'd also sent the manuscript of Nigel's book to Daniel Shore because I'd interviewed Shore once. I've heard about this because yeah. you know who yeah. I know is 
Phyllis Pollock. Oh, oh you said Phyllis. Phyllis. I know Phyllis. Well, I Phyllis is the one who uh, was involved with the PMRC. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. And then, then she, when you sent your manuscript to her, she called me up. I'll bet. I can't believe this. And I'm going, listen, anybody who writes anything about Frank, to me, I want to read it. I don't care if you it's like it lies or, or horrible or what. <laughs> I, I collect Zappa information. Phyllis couldn't take it? <laughs> I call him Gail and I tell him <laughs> They were telling you uh, things you didn't know. Uh, no, I figured that. And I figured that Actually, scenario. now you figured Phyllis would react that That's exactly way. Oh, Phyllis is like, so. so she, and then the greatest thing about Phyllis is she went from from being a, a rock and roll, heavy Rolling metal. Stone metalhead, to now she handles all the nastiest black rap there is. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, the to totally, yeah. you know, what she called a Frank once saying, I'm going to commit suicide over this PMRC thing, and Frank's going, I'm going out with a movie with my family. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he couldn't handle it, which is very rare. Frank yeah. never yeah. went out. Yeah. But we better we continue suddenly had to But just very quickly, so Rip yeah. Brown started writing these long... We had a pen pal for a well, yeah. In fact, you know, every day. Just every, they got I kept more and more letters. bizarre. About, oh, like, about, about, your, about, the, about the this book. Yeah, the book. about this how is not, recent. Yeah. And about you how Nigel had no right. To, to, uh, he asked us not to. I don't know. But yeah. how Nigel <laughs> had, uh, had no right to write it. And I said, you know, a person has a right to write about their life. I mean, that's. Something that important, of course? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't no, have to get per important. permission. From God. Yeah, he serves acting like she had to get permission from Gail. Yeah, from the here's state. the here's the bottom line. I'll tell yeah, you. Let me the just reaction to that. Here, here. No, I, I just tuned out. Was he trying to review your book, or you wouldn't yeah. review it? He wouldn't no, review he wouldn't it review because it. it had sex in it. Right, or personal he said, that infected Gail yeah. or family yeah, values. That's what, well, that's what I told him. And I, you're yeah. saying he's under Gail's wing. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just I saying. Understand. Myself, who's read at least Frank, eight books on Frank, mm -hmm. and a friend of mine who's a total heavy zapologist, both agreed, it's a good read. And you get to realize who Frank is as a human being, whereas most of the books, including don't himself, yeah. his own book, you don't even really get what's behind it. Mm -hmm. And I say, it doesn't even matter if it's all true or not. Right. And my, this yeah. other guy I yeah. knew when I saw you at Book Soup, mm -hmm. he was the one, the doubting guy, and he says, is this book true? I <laughs> and I thought guy. that was the most yeah. um, insulting question. It was hilarious. Because you, yeah. you, 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 you know, I go. No, I made it all up. Right. Well, you I guys said it. I said, well, you have to tell these guys this. Look, if I made this whole story up, I give me a medal for Give me the Pulitzer Prize. Right, right. And that's it. And even though it was an insulting question, I thought you handled it well, and I thought it was appropriate for him because he felt he had asked. People, nothing upsets me unless somebody, like the equivalent of what Matt was doing to Frank. You know, if somebody's just like doesn't give a shit, they're hurting so bad about something that right. they're going to come after me with an axe. Well, I don't want to get hit with an axe for all the wrong reasons. Have you heard Matt's reaction to the book? No. Oh, have no. you? No, I don't know. Hmm. We didn't send. But, him but one. the the other we were thinking of trying to get a blurb from him for the back of the novel. Is now he's part of the Orthodox. He's part of the. Oh, he's on the Gale. Yeah, Orthodox is the Gale. Of, the Gale game. But he does the Church of Orthodox Gale. That's yeah. Yeah. No, but the other thing yeah. is he he sort of wavers because the last time yeah. I talked to him he sort of he doesn't quite get it. Mm -hmm. But the funniest doesn't part. Doesn't get what. Of being totally under Gail's wing, he doesn't get. He doesn't Gale. understand. See, once you're under Gail's wing, you just go, "Oh yeah, yeah," and she put up with it. But he, mm -hmm. he, he had this weird sort of. thing. Are you saying he's perceiving that the Gail dictatorship, or he's not? He's not under her wing. He knows that Gail's a little off and yeah. whack, but he still doesn't want to fluff the yeah. wings yeah. too much. Yeah. Well, really he doesn't want to screw it up. Yeah. He doesn't want to string it up. What's really strange, mm -hmm. not just observe that. Uh, my dear uncle Yehudi has a wife who's just like Gail. She is. Diana oh, that, that's a syndrome. She's, except she's much that's, more intelligent. Than yeah, that. That's a yeah. dead. That's yeah. called dead composer syndrome. My friend yeah, told me yeah, that's true. when the composer died. But the funniest was at book soup. I was trying to sneak out because I didn't want to get seen. Didn't want to get blood in too much. Hands. And 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 then that you guy goes. What? He didn't want to get blood in his hands. And then yeah. Dave, the, my friend who was at the bar, was asked you that question. Yeah. Jerry called me over, and then I'm talking to him. And then eventually you started there, and it was perfect. We just started talking. Yeah. And I says, Yeah, um, what kind of birth control did you use? That was great. And, and you go, well, How many books are you reading? Yeah. Buying? And David goes, Three. And he goes, Bingo, okay. And then that was in reference to Bob's interview, which we'll mm -hmm. give you. Uh -huh. and, and he said, yeah, right, In him. the middle of this philosophical question, he asked him, No, Jerry, you know, why don't we read it? Or we'll read it to you. Yeah. But on, on tape? No, 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 oh, not on tape. Yeah. Just, 
Uh, can would you be able to find it? No, yeah, but it's very okay. simple. But he just says, "What kind of birth?" You know, he's talking about early sex. No, I'm asking about his first girlfriend, mm -hmm. and he's talking about a girl he had in high school. Right, right. That, yeah, I remember that from the conversation. Right, right. I he told her it already. She oh, knows. And, the, oh. yeah. and what kind of birth control you use? And, and he, Frank says it's not. Uh, it's appropriate to this philosophical, philosophical. We had established a philosophical oh, level. Oh, sort of thing. Yeah. He said, but what, what was it? What I, I must said, have thought that was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. He's probably chuckling at what he said. Well, yeah. What was it? I asked. I said, did, What kind of birth control? Did you no, use? I said, Did you? Oh, did, did you practice safe did sex? You no, out? did you what practice you? safe sex? And he said, That's not. Yeah, he wouldn't right. answer. Oh. So what happened? You, you found out. Yeah, you told me she. He did use a condom because you demanded it. No, no, no. 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 He, she was. Uh, oh, you were on he birth started control. to. Yeah, I, I was taking the pill. He says, "Well, you know, the first time we ever had sex, you know, he's got a rubber." And I said, "What's the overcoat for?" He says, "Well, it's just a policy. You know, it's like I don't know you that well, and blah 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 blah." And you know, he picked up a pretty good dose of the clap a couple times and didn't want to take it home. You know, I can yeah. understand. I said, "Well, okay, look, I'm clean. You know, I don't have any problems with this, but." If we're going to do this, you got to trust me better than that. It's no overcoat or forget it. Yeah. I just didn't give him any any choice. And it, also, you told me you're on the pill. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, yeah, sex with rubber is like forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Hand jobs better. <laughs> like my one friend says, that's like eating a tuna sandwich with a, a, a wrapping on it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. and that that was sort of a zap ass thing. Yeah, thing exactly. To say. This is a, I don't know. This maybe should not be on tape. But I was going to ask you when <laughs> when you say to Lionel for not getting upset to spike fair cause yeah. is that in reference to seventy five? Okay. Um, you're married and you have a little thing with Frank. No, the whole thing with Frank. I mean, Frank Lionel Lionel's I, been I just wonderfully. Point, I, I came to a point. He where gave I me said, an ultimatum. He said, "Frank goes or I go." Before you got married. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In other words, what you at the end of my is that a way of saying, "Will you marry me?" Well, I don't know. He's what were you? Is that what you were saying? You're, well, I was just you, saying, if, if whatever if, happens, is yeah, if we're going to stay together, Frank, you better Frank, right. we'll get rid of this guy. Now, was, sense, yeah. was that after this the bathroom incident? The bathroom incident was you we know, weren't married yet, actually, when the bathroom thing happened. Oh, it says you were married. See, here. Bob, you're blowing all the ones yeah. I knew, and you thought you knew. The what? The one about the bathroom and I went, meaning oh, to okay, coming. Went. Come on. Okay, now wait a minute. You were married then. I might have just gotten married. Yeah, yeah because right. Don. Uh, no, let me just check that. Well, the B part. Isn't that when it yeah. happens when you just get married? No, look, you were married. You were, ma you were married with Don because you took your husband up there. That was yeah, but the thing with Frank and then in the Frank got mad after that. Yeah, the thing and with Frank in the bathroom was after that though. It was after that. Yeah, so I was probably so you were married. Yeah. So the just caught. So you told her. It's okay, I, won't I told you about it, it too. I told you about it. It's big bubble. So you had an honest, pretty yeah. honest result. Yeah, I told him. So the, the thing is that when you said it was hardly a surprise. But it was he like, gave the ultimatum was before you got married. Yeah, basically, That's and I was trying to taper off because yeah. I kept thinking because I actually there was some you know, notions entertained of me actually performing with with Frank in as late as uh, seventy four because I did when he was putting on trying to put on Hunch and Toot the you know, Queen right. of the Universe thing, Rock and the Queen of the Universe, and it was uh, Hunch and Toot at the what? It was Hunch. What was the name of it? It was Hunch and Toot something. Hunch and Toot and Drachma was just the working title. No, but you said at the separate, universe. Yeah, it was like I think it was Drachma Queen of the Universe. Oh, the well, I see title. what you're saying. Oh, you might have been in that. Because yeah, I I did audition for that vocal spot, and I thought I did okay, and so did the other band members. Frank was kind of upset, and nobody could figure out why. Uh, that and you did well. Is that in the book? Yeah, Sounds familiar. Yeah, 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 you have that in here. Yeah. He was upset. He's really really strange about that whole thing. Yeah. He lied about the whole. You know, it was obvious he wanted me to audition. That was his old dilemma coming yeah. back. Yeah. Maybe he knew the karma that yeah. he got. Yeah, he didn't want to. I don't want to do it. I'm not gonna get again. killed again. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, I would have pushed him off. Yeah, yeah. 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 L.A. Yeah. journalist kills Frank. <laughs> you beat you beat uh, Nina Hagen in uh, Barbara Streisand out. Yeah, I've heard that those he wanted. You them. told me it was Barbara Streisand. That was right. Oh, did I tell you? Yeah. He, no, that he wanted. I don't yeah. think she she was she ever. She would never wanted to do it. Yeah. yeah. I like in the book. I say Ben Miller would have been perfect. Yeah, because it was that kind of a neurotic Jew. That's, a, right. that's who we always thought would be yeah. cast as Gale in the Frank Zappa movie. <laughs> really, <laughs> that that. you guys thought that? Blue. <laughs> Blue. <laughs> okay, what a nightmare. Who do you want to play Nigel Lennon? Um, it's probably somebody who hasn't come up yet, and probably will have one movie to their credit, and that'll be it. There you go. <laughs> All right, no, what, what? For good reason. 
Um, why is there movie offers? No, oh. yeah. <laughs> no. Um, because the thing is, is I, you know, I'd probably get my butt suit off if anything. We yeah. all sort of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Gale sort Gale of Gale Army would come out. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, in our world, we we like who's our world, Jerry? Well, the, just <laughs> your world. Whatever we think, <laughs> if you're get su- if you w- get sued by Gale, that means you made it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah we've, been, we've been hoping she would pull something. Right. Back, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. Did there. you hear Moon on uh, one of the morning talk shows? Mm-hmm. They said, "Have you the one Somebody at actually? Asked you know that it's the um, all the people at L.A. the bookstore. Ed Krasner. Oh yeah, yeah. Peter yeah. Tilton. Right, okay, know. Peter yeah. Tilton mm-hmm. and Tracy had Moon on. Uh huh. Oh. And, and and they asked her. They said, "Have you? Well, what do you think about the books about Frank?" She goes, "Now this is Gail brainwashing her perfect." No or God. Moon. She goes, "The only book I know about Frank is my dad's book." Yeah. It's like I said. Come I said on. to Bob. I said, "Moon, it would be so great for Moon to read your book." Yeah, she yeah. would get an, a, a vision yeah. of her dad, and she probably her. has, or somebody should give it to her and say, "Moon, mm-hmm. this is something you should read. Why not?" I'll, I'll give you a copy if you want to give her one. Oh, I, 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 I don't really see any of them. Yeah, that guy uh, Ed Krasnick. Uh, we talked to him because yeah. you know, and he was you know, ho ho ho. He's the one who, family. Ho ho ho. Said, he's well, the one who interviewed Moon at right. L.A. the bookstore. Right, and I said, well, I no. What was the issue when he went? Oh ho. ho well, you? we we met him at, actually. When, the first time I ever went to the store to talk to um, Gabriel. Uh, John, John. You, uh, about me doing a, a thing there or whatever, you know, just checking in. He's kind of a neat place, you know. I, and he said no. Ed was there. He showed up. I'd never met him in my life before. He says, "Oh yeah, I know the family." And a little red flag went up, and I said, "Well, you know, here I'll give you a copy of my book. I hope you enjoy it. And do you think the kids might like to read it?" <laughs> And that's when he went. Mm. Ooh, 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 yeah. you know, the, so now you're saying that's yeah. explained. And now it no, 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 also too, Gabriel Gabriel tried, to tried to get me on his radio show. Get, 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 he does something at KFW. Yeah, and, he has a regular and, and pro- the, yeah, the thing probably the moon was on. Yeah. Yeah. And he tried to get you on. <laughs> well, John well, did. Gabriel tried to get. And Ed, Ed did not. Ed, Ed, John is the owner of L.A. the bookstore since he works with. Ed Krasnick, who's part of Peter and Tracy's radio show, and he does some radio, then they said, why don't we get Nige on this radio who's show? Who's Gabriel? The John. The owner, John, oh, John. the owner of yeah. L.A. Yeah. Books. So he suggested to somebody to, to, Kras- to, to he Krasnick. He tried to get Krasnick to contemplate the idea of having Nige on, on the show, and yeah. I guess uh, he got... Right, because right. Ed, no, you had the encounter with Ed where he goes, no, 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 when you offered the book. Is that before no, that encounter? After, that was after. Because Ed, John Ed, had already pr- approached him, I think, and I was just trying to, you know, be nice and be friendly. Yeah, and, because know. Ed has had Moon at LA the bookstore. Ah, doing a, an appearance of some yeah, sort. Appearance. Yeah, well, Everyone's quoting. Right. Oh, I thought uh, it was a radio thing. I'm sorry. No, it's it, no. Why? Moon was on a radio show That's, with Peter and Tracy. That's when the question was asked. Right. Mm-hmm. Ed is part of that radio right. show, and, and he, he had Moon live in his little show he has every Wednesday there. At the bookstore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, okay. I see. Yeah, yeah there, it's funny how influential the Gale is in L.A. Sure. You know? I mean, I didn't know until a few years ago, but she is quite influential. Mm-hmm. Is. Wait, Beverly Delangelo, you know? Yeah. Well, that well, that's influential. She's not influential. I don't well, think control, that's the right word. You she mean. has a control aspect in L.A. Well, because it, anybody that needs to do anything having to do with Frank's work at this yeah. point in time has got to go through her but you know you, you know, the in that, that regard no but here's the thing the image that Frank is outside the system right maybe it's because of the kids but his wife is very part of some is very mm-hmm. uh, strong control agent within some part of the media system of mm-hmm. Hollywood that people sure. express yeah. sure you, because they, I've been finding that I mean there are so many people that have such funny ideas about Frank and where did they come from yeah we know you yeah. know but, no, but yeah, we, we found that on a number of different occasions just because so, of his book so that's yeah. a, that's an unknown thing that yeah. you're just fine yeah I figured that out a yeah. couple of years ago that something's going on here with oh, Gail yeah. yeah there's yeah. definitely been a control of uh, all information yeah, actually about despite Frank. all her what you call it the book's gotten amount of attention yeah yeah is it selling well yeah it's kind of it's in second printing well it's not making, it's, it's not, it's not you know we're not selling you know, millions we're, of them but it's, still, it moves how many copies have you made credit cards uh about eight thousand and it's they're they're the the, the four thousand's gone and oh yeah. Is coming yeah, yeah oh yeah long gone in fact, so we're gonna at have a certain to point you'll it. start getting in there in the black right we're actually in the black now. Oh, that's and, and the um the uh, uh 
that includes uh, worldwide sales. I'm sorry. <laughs> that includes worldwide sales. Well, we do you guys workers. know? Okay, here's a question. You guys seem to know a lot of things. Um, where the heck? Who do we contact about international stuff on this book? Um, my website on Worldwide Web gets a lot of hits from Europe. We're getting people in Estonia wanting to know about this. We had a guy who's supposed to be agenting the book. He's not He's doing, doing doodling. Yeah. I don't. So you wonder how to get into Europe? Yeah. yeah. Whether okay. somebody buys translation rights or I'd prefer that rather than having to ship them. Yeah. Because you have to yeah. put money up physically, and then you lose. Really you can lose money right. definitely yeah. that way. Oh, I can't have you. Have then, you then you got to yeah, get them does. to pay you after they put it right. out. Right. That's There's a right. guy in in England, for example, who does a he's um, does a Zappa. To Mercy, do we? Well, yeah, he ran a review of it, which I. Oh no, no, you mean uh, GNS Music? Yeah. Oh yeah, he's the best guy to get. To really, because he wants to order some. Yeah, Good. And they'll put cash up front. He says, but you know, it might be a couple weeks before we hear from him. But yeah, he'll, he'd like. Oh, I go it. through Gina's. I know. Jerry, why, why don't we um, give the tape of this thing, and you guys have a supplement? Would you, would they, you want to sell that? Is that a part? Is that a way of advertising? Does that help the book? If yeah, you have it's, that not, doesn't, it's I, not a I bad idea. I wouldn't. I'm It'd be easy to do it. because you mean well, like a, a transcript say, of the interview. No, what just if somebody wants to hear a, a good interview, you say, yeah. you can say, we recommend this interview if you want to know more than yeah. the book or what's behind yeah, it. Yeah, I'd, I'd like you to offer yeah. the tape to people. No, Spencer would or, could sell the t uh, two tape set. Yeah, or let whatever. somebody else sell the tape. Well, yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, because yeah, it would help a yeah. book, but I don't have any idea how to sell And Aaron has had no luck selling tapes. Yeah. No, but I mean, there's. let me, let me think about it. Yeah, that's yeah. not a bad idea because. People, well, I no, think, that's the whole yeah. thing. It's not an idea of making money off the tapes. It's, it's just that make it available. It's a out supplement, because, and it makes them yeah. want to go yeah. buy the it's book. Gonna, yeah, it's it going to make people look at the book differently. I wouldn't but know. It's going to make people no, look be at good the book have, differently. No, it'd be good to have the tapes out there. I, I can't think of any way to really sell it. with. Not sell them. Not sell them. Just, just uh, make them available. Announce that if you want more. Yeah. And to the extent that I have a notorious image or name, they say, oh, Bob Dobbs. Yeah, well, we'll see what Bob said. But it's turning out we're given the whole story here yeah. you know we're filling yeah. it out what are you going to do if it what yeah do you, what plans do you have well we Jerry, just, it's just i have this interview series and and when people who are interested in bob i make them available but i try to make them available to radio stations like when i had a show on kpfk mm -hmm. yeah like I was it was on readily on for many years you know so david porter would have played this in a second mm -hmm. but he has he doesn't yeah, have a up. show anymore yeah. so well, i don't aggressively go and mm -hmm. seek it so in in other words for someone to play a three hour, which it is at this point, <laughs> David Porter's the only nut in radio history who would do it. Yeah. I mean, I did two and a half hours with this great filmmaker, and he played it all. In the middle of the interview, the guy yells, Who in the fuck's ever going to play this? <laughs> <laughs> and it was my first. And it was my first. Play this? Play this? <laughs> so and then and then transcribing it's another possibility, yeah. but that's not one of my top priorities. No, I can. But imagine. but it's really. I mean, the whole the whole thing was to get you two to just talk because mm -hmm. it would be interesting. Which yeah. so, we're doing. Which we're you know, doing. Which yeah. is working well. Yeah. So we should continue if you guys. Okay. You know. There was what? What were we talking? And did we get everything done in the interim? Um. I just want to refocus here where we were. Well, you wanted to, to talk about music. Yeah, that's what I. Yeah. I got the quote. I want to find. The